So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have a guest, special guest tonight, of course, Arnold Slobb. We're going to be talking about, about wildlife and, uh, and a whole bunch of stuff. Because you know, what, what I really wanted to find out was, was about uh, animals in the, in the area, in the urban areas. And, and if there's an animal in trouble, there's a wild animal in trouble, Arnold's the one that gets called out to sort things out. If there's an animal making a nuisance of itself, Arnold's the one gets, that gets called out. But we're going to chat to him tonight, and we can ask him any question you like. We test a whole bunch of topics. So let's welcome onto the stage, Mr. Arnold Slubbert. Welcome to the show. Now is your turn to shine. We're going to have a lack of chat tonight. Another good time. We go, and we're in. <laughs> in and live. Welcome, Arnold. Mm. Fantastic to have you on the show. So there's no action replay if I say things. Eh? No, no, be no, careful. Ac- no, no action replay. No, you're this not going to cut. It's live. It's yeah. live. But yeah. there's no rules, you know, with this. And and we've tended to have uh, great conversations before, and nobody's got into any deep trouble yet, mm-hmm. you know, yet. <laughs> oh, <not> yet. <laughs> but Arnold, I'm, I'm going to take my notes here as well because uh, because there, there's there's quite a, few, uh, a couple of little things that, that that we need to that you need to touch on. But at the moment. Your your day at the moment. What, what are you What are you you busy with? What are your projects at the moment that you that you busy with? Okay, you know it's a nice time of year for me because I get more time to do things that I actually want to do. Yeah. The summer months are traditionally very busy work wise and also with a lot of wildlife issues, wildlife rescues, that kind of stuff. Okay. But once you start going into winter, it gets quiet. Okay. Um. I. At the end of releasing owls, I think that we have possibly another 20 to go and then all the owl rescues will be released back into the wild, wow. which is always a great time because, you know, the, the one thing I always love is people say, Arnold, you have a wonderful job. Saving wildlife not yeah. how I earn a living. Saving okay. wildlife is what I do for fun. Yeah. Right. So the more wildlife I can release, the less pressure on me. So I've got to feed all of these animals. And I was thinking, you know, I was thinking today about, I don't often think about these talks, but I was thinking I might need to give you a little rundown. Yes. So at this time of year, which is quiet, I need 40 day old chicks. I need about 30 rats and I need about 20 pigeons every single day. So that is my food bowl, right? (sighs) To feed these birds and keep them going. Yeah. So this is the quiet time of year. When it gets really busy, that's, yeah, right. that's now. Then it's, then it's quite frightening the amount of food that you need to feed everybody. Mm-hmm. It's not the kind of food you can go and buy at a supermarket or no. that's food that you have to source one way or another. And it's what those birds need to remain very healthy. That's the wild animals. Yeah, then yeah. Um, Jackie Neil Shute, who helps me with a lot of stuff, she's sitting with otters, she's sitting with mongooses and that. All of those need something else. And it, well, they, <laughs> otters eat a lot of fish. I'm sure. Let me tell you, they eat one hell of a lot of fish. It's quite amazing. Yeah. You know, and then uh, Janita Grasper helps me a lot of the owls. She's also sitting with a good few owls and stuff as well that she's also looking after. So the, there's a vast amount of animals that require feeding, and that all has to be sourced one way or another. So I'm pretty glad when it reaches this time of year, and most of them can go free, and I can take a bit of break from having to worry every day, yes, have I got enough food, food, and how am I going to source stuff? And, and I mean, because uh, one of, the, one of the, the triggers for me was, was to, to get you on as well, because I've been thinking about getting you on for a long time. Uh, since we had some meetings down with the valley, we're talking about the yeah. valley, valley edge stuff here. But um, I, I, caught a, I caught a rat, uh, in, and uh, just to explain, I caught a rat in my little cage, and I thought I was being so good because I caught this rat live. You know, it, it's, mm. this little cage, it's got a thing, a trigger, and it closes the other side of the cage and catches it live. And then I let it out into the valley. And Oral said, no, oh, you can't let it out in the valley. But what we're saying now is we probably should collect them all together and give it to you for your food. Well, a lot of people do drop them off for food. Really? Okay, so the important thing to remember is that when you deal with rats, and I mean, it drives me insane when people say, oh, a little field mouse in the house. Yeah. They're invariably house rats, okay. right, which are an exotic invasive species. And house rats themselves are responsible for many extinctions, particularly of birds and that. They raid every bird nest, they eat the chicks, etc., etc. So when you get a house rat in your house, it needs to be killed. Not taken and released into a natural area so it can carry on its yeah. way of killing everything around it. But the thing is not to kill it with poison as well. So I obviously, did one thing right. Obviously. You did the right thing and I was very impressed with that <laughs> using a trap. It means it sunk in. Okay. You know, and we have to go to the poison thing, which has been one of my big campaigns. Yeah, and yeah. it breaks my heart every time and year in, year out. Come... Uh, 
end of this sort of breeding season when the owls are really hunting, yeah. we'll get two or three poisoned owls a week, sometimes two or three poisoned owls a day. And, you know, people were saying, I, I was watching a post on Facebook and they said, oh, you know, we've got owls in the rain. Of course you've got owls in the rain. We've just released a whole lot. Let's see okay. how long they stay around. Wow. You know, that's a sad okay, thing. Okay, so you release into, into those areas. Uh, well, where, where into the surrounding the, small yeah. holding and they move into town. Right. Okay. So the one thing that is just mind blowing to me is I was actually going through all my stats and data, and on one particular street corner in Lorraine, I got three poisoned owls over the years, over the yeah. last four years, on okay. exactly the same street same corner street. next to a townhouse complex. Okay. So it really is, it really is a sad situation. And you know, my big focus has always been keeping wildlife in the urban areas as much as possible, yeah. which is why the Balkans has always been close to my heart because yeah. it's an area that originally had a lot of wildlife in, a lot of interesting wildlife. You know, the Balkans had honey badgers, it had um, blue diker, which yes. are threatened species, Cape Lawless otters, what and so it goes on bushbuck, kreisbuck, yeah. common diker, and a whole host of other smaller mammals, etc., etc. Yeah. So the Balkans has always been close to my heart, it's the green lung of the city, and I'm yeah. very, very passionate about the fact that wildlife also has a place in the city. Yeah. You know, but unfortunately, these areas are not being protected properly, and there's a lot of illegal hunting pressure yeah. on them. There's a lot of dogs wandering around, killing things, and you know, it's just a very sad state of affairs. Because we're just we're just talking about these these uh, areas are protected areas, like like the, the the public open spaces that that um, that people go and hunt and stuff on. They've got animals as well, but but those public spaces are not actually protected. Whereas Whereas the municipality really should be protecting these areas, like the, like the Barkins Valley. And, and well, not only the Barkins Valley, all the reserves and stuff yeah. need to be protected as okay, well. They need to be properly protected and the strict letter of the law enforced yeah. there. And that is one of the, the, the big issues. Yeah. And, you know, that is where I'm often at a crossroads. A lot of people who like rescuing animals and that because one of our biggest problems is feral animals, be it dogs or cats, uh -huh. in natural areas. Yeah. And yeah. the destruction they cause with wildlife. You know, so it is, a, it is a major issue. And the other day, there was an extremely interesting post on a, on a Facebook post in, yeah. in Lorraine. Yeah. And a woman was saying, oh, a cat had been killed by three dogs. And my first question was, was your cat in the yard? Yeah. No. It, was in it the, wasn't. In the yard it was wandering the around maiming birds and wildlife. Three dogs who also were wandering around maiming birds and wildlife <laughs> killed the cat. You know, so it is a very, very... And unfortunately, you sit with these rabid animal rights, oh, I love my cats and my cat would never, kind of situation, it's not like that, yeah. you know, cats and dogs need to be kept by their owners, and they are one of the biggest problems facing the valley, in fact, this very afternoon, what did I see, a big black tom hunting away merrily in the valley, yeah. and you know, it's very interesting, as I told you before the show, there's a very interesting graph, number one killer of birds in the world, cats, Fair number cats. two, Motor vehicles. No, domestic oh, and domestic. feral. Both okay, of them okay. are doing the job. Okay. Number two, motor vehicles. Number three, poison. The sad oh, thing motor is... Motor vehicles is second. Oh, that, that's crazy. Yeah. The sad thing is, at the bottom of the list, wind farms. Wind farms, which is supposed to be the, which is the one that everybody Which is the oh, one which everyone saw. Yes, and someone rightfully said, but wind farms kill a lot of threatened or endangered species. Yeah. Yes, maybe, maybe. Yeah, yeah, okay. You know, and I'm not pro wind bigger. farms, I don't like them. I find them revolting things on the horizon. They really disturb my karma every time I drive past and I see these structures sticking out of nowhere. <laughs> they destroy my karma. But point of the matter is, it is very interesting when you start looking at the science as to what is actually causing. And we have a massive decline in bird population in gardens and in surrounding areas. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of side factors that are playing a role. First of all, gardeners love poison. I mean, right. if you go to Indian nursery, 50% of what they're selling is poison. They sell more poison than plants, I'm sure, yes. most of them. Like this, you know, uh, all of this stuff. Call it, um, this the weed killer stuff. Uh, um, Roundup. Your Roundup. Roundup. Yeah, and all these herbicides and things that they sell. And then, of course, we need to remember that the whole marketing strategy of the world is based on fooling the consumer. Yeah. You know, so what do you do? Eco-friendly, green, oh, yeah, you got it. all of those right Marketing. terms. And what happens? People want to do good, right? Yeah. But people are also stupid. <laughs> Why do you say that, Arnold? What does the label say? Toxic to fish and wildlife. What do you expect? You've got a green pro Toxic to fish and wildlife? Green, 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 green. as well. So you ask me, what disappears out of gardens? Jeez, when I was a kid, our garden was full of chameleons. Yeah. There's no more chameleons. Pesticides. Yeah. Cats. 
Okay. Right? There's just no more chameleons. And if we don't see those warning signs, and they're there right in front of us, mm. we just don't see them. We choose to ignore them. It's an inconvenient truth. And I go back to my favorite words by Rachel Carson, and everyone should read The Silent yeah. Spring. Yeah, and you know what that spring. is? As crude a weapon as a caveman's club, the yeah. chemical barrage we hurl against the fabric of life. Really? And Rachel Carson was an amazing woman years before her time, but she already warned us, be careful of this chemical Chemicals. barrage you're hurling against the fabric yeah. of life. Yeah. And you know, we've got to be so careful because it's so easy to become self-righteous. And I know a lot of people who are vegan because I believe animals shouldn't die. Yeah. But do you know how much poison goes on crops today? Yeah. Even so-called organic, organic crops. Organic crops. A friend of mine said to me, he said, you know, all of these organic foods you're eating, they cause more damage than anything else because the consumer wants food X way and to get it X way, they have to use a lot of toxic poisons. I'll give you a little classic story quickly. I love these kind of stories because people need to think and people don't think. You know, we just have to look at this little flu scam and see that people actually don't think past their noses. They kind of all follow each other, you know, like little sheep in a rye and say, oh, you know, this is it. The end of the world is here. So I'm out in the field. One of my big passions is training gun dogs. I'm training gun dogs for trials. And I've what got my... Gun dogs? Uh, working dogs. Oh, okay. Working dogs. Okay. So oh, I'm like training my dogs. dogs. I've got my good friend, Brandon. Ooh. I hope Brandon doesn't listen to the show. <laughs> he probably is. Somebody <laughs> tell Brandon. Someone's going to tell Brandon. <laughs> my good friend, Brandon, who knows everything about making money. Unlike me, he knows. Okay. Brandon knows everything and he makes lots of money. He farms, etc., okay. etc. Et okay, We're walking in the fields, lovely fields, canola, ex- And I'm looking at the ground. I said, geez, Brandon. What is this stuff on the ground, this blue part? Oh, that's snail bait. Snails love canola. So I look, and as far as your eye can see, there's canola land. So I said, are you telling me this is all snail bait? Yeah. Yes, snail And I look at all the dead insects lying on the edge of the land, and I start thinking to myself, geez, you know, Arnold, it's been years lost since you've seen bat eared foxes, yeah? Mm, they're gone. Yeah, yeah. No, no, you start thinking about this. Yeah, 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 yeah. A little bit later, it's a hot day. Dogs are going to the cliff. They have a drink of water. The next thing, the dogs are all violently ill. So this was immediately a trigger for me. So I took, but you see, this is the one thing, because I actually have a very, very good background in investigation. So I know, first thing I look for is clues, evidence, that kind of stuff. And I know exactly how to do this stuff. So I collected a whole lot of water, I collected a whole lot of water samples, right? And sealed them, kept them. And then I dared open my mouth about the snail bait. Oh, right. Right. Was I shot down? Oh, you don't know what you're talking about. You greenies are idiots. You know nothing. This stuff just breaks down. It's harmless. It's like candy for kids. Oh, cool. Anyway, let's see what a laboratory says about this. So take a guess what? The laboratory would put their name to the results. Oh, right. Oh, yes. Huh, what do you think? Eh? What do you think? It couldn't be good if you, if you, yep. No laboratory would put their name to the results. Finally, we got a result from a laboratory that said, look, we won't put our name on the top, but this is the result. The metaldehyde percentage in the water was 70 times what is safe for human consumption. That is water that's ending up in the groundwater. It's water that's ending up in the rivers and the sea. Why do you think the world's going where it is? Yeah. The chemical barrage we all against this fabric of life. Yeah. Right? And there we all said, oh, no, I'm vegan. I'm vegan. Yeah. I don't harm a thing. Sorry, people. Well, I suppose Humans like- have an impact. You want to save the world? Stop breeding. Yeah, well, like, like the rat poisons and stuff as well. Let's just have a whole lot of comments have just come on here. Let's have a quick, quick squiz at some of these comments. Just uh, uh, Wendy saying, um, we have a, f- a fat rat on our garden and our complex. Uh, you can have it with pleasure, she says. <laughs> we'll you need to, to catch it, it Wendy. You've got to catch it yeah. in, those, in those cages. Our friend Des is in our breeding box placed, uh, placed just before she died. The year after she died, the owls arrived and bred every year for 10 years since. Lovely to see them there every year. Lovely. That must be, I, I wonder where that is. I know uh, exactly where that one is. Yes, I know. Oh, where lovely. That one is. lovely. And Marinda oh. Pereira says as well, I, I, I thank you for uh, what you're doing for the animals. Oh, she's thanking you there. And uh, John Klein, exactly. Is he green with you? <laughs> There's a nail on the head, he says. Um, and uh, Marinda, sorry for uh, for what you do. Yes, no, thank you for what you're doing for all the animals. And uh, it's like um, that. that uh, that poison thing, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, I mean, all farmland will, will have some sort of poison, like you say, snail bait, that, that's quite, I mean, if there was such a lot of it, you know, and it's, it, do all farm, is there not, there, okay. there's, there's, do you know, there's let a me, farming let, that you can do that, that's, that's, 
Let me put it to you like this. So yours truly now, the whole time, metaldehyde, metaldehyde, metaldehyde. Mm. My good friend, Dr. Matt says, you know, Arnold, Holland, where I come from, Mm. that stuff's big trouble. It's in all the wildlife, et cetera, et cetera. Snail bait, snail bait, metaldehyde. Of course, all the people that found me, oh, Arnold, I've got a hardy dart sick in my garden. Yeah. Are you using snail bait? Yes, I'm using snail bait. Yeah. It's gardens as well. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, all the homeowners use snail bait. Listen, I got taught a valuable lesson by a friend of mine, and she knows exactly who she is. She goes out every night when it's a bit misty and she catches every single snail in the garden. What? Passionately. She catches all the snails, puts them in a bucket and disposes them. That's how she controls snails in the garden. She taught me something that I never ever knew and I'm telling you it works like a charm. How do you Soon catch them? You just grab them by hand and drop them in a bucket. But when, when do they come out then? You, you know? After dark, on a nice misty night, after a bit of rain, go and look on all your vegetables and stuff. You just pull them off by hand. Is that when they come out? out? Gary, that's when they get to your vegetables. I need to find it because I, that's, I, no, that's wait, till, is wait, till, wait till a nice misty night and go and grab those. Snow. Anyway, she yeah. does, and I was blown away, and it works like a charm. Yeah. So yeah. there are they all ways and means. Anyway, farmers can't do that. Let's be honest. Yeah, so, okay. what I was going to say to you so now yeah. I'm coming in the rain, and he has a truck. And I look at it. Huh. What's the stuff on the back? Snail bait. Yeah. 20, 30 ton, whatever ton is those big trucks carry of snail bait. Where's the snail bait going? Oh, no, to the citrus farmers. Yeah, yeah. They use it there as well. Where does that. All the runner from the citrus farms go. Cantus River, yeah. Sunday's River. Hey? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where's all that stuff ending yeah, up? Yeah. In the sea. You must be like me that gets under that water and has a little looky. You look around a lot of these river mouths, it's dead zones. You go to America around the Mississippi Delta, it's dead zone for 150 kilometers. Yeah. Oh, sorry, maybe 150 miles. But it's yeah, yeah. Yeah. right all the way out to sea. There's not a living thing left there. Really? Yeah. 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 Uh, oh, locusts. okay. Well, let's yes, talk about, about the locusts. Locust? Tell us no, about let's the talk locusts. about the locusts. Why do we have a locust problem? Yeah. Overgrazing. Yeah. Locusts are at their best in overgrazed ground. In fact, it stimulates them to breed. They go for it. How do, how does it work? They lay their, their eggs in the, in the ground and just wait until it rains. What? Okay, so go back to my conservation days 30 years ago. Yeah. All right. Was that long ago? Jeez. No. I thought I was 21. <laughs> what happened there? No, you're, Jeez. you're clearly not, not 21. 21. <laughs> okay, so anyway, so I go back to my conservation days. So now I'm walking a fence, Utnag area, right? Four kilometers of fence. 32 bat foxes and gin traps on the fence. You know those slug aces under the yeah, fence? Yeah. Set by the stockman for lynx and jackal because they're killing sheep and goats. Yeah. Go to the farmer and say, listen, you know, what, the, what are you doing here? Yeah, but you know, jackal and lynx eat a sheep of mine. There's no ways I can allow that. Yeah. What do you think art wolves, bat-eared foxes, all of those creatures do? What do you think yeah. they're digging and eating and all that kind of stuff? Same what do you think a lot of, of these birds do that we have persecuted to the edge of extinction by all of this poison? Yeah. They catch locusts. They dig eggs. They all, we're yeah. killing ourselves. And then we all say, oh, woe is us. Look at this amazing plague. We're the plague. There's only one plague. It's humans. Yeah. You know, but the sad thing is, even though we are plague, we will not accept responsibility for our actions, will we? We'll always blame something else. And when the time comes when we need to take action, we don't want to take that action. We'll rather stand back and hold ourselves holier than thou and let someone else do the dirty work and then criticize them for doing that dirty work and saying, well, you know. So I think we were discussing earlier. So let's get into the the topic of problem animal management, which is actually what I do for a living. So I need to look holistically at problems now believe it or not i do problem animal control i do bubonic plague monitoring collecting bubonic plague sampling and lately i've been forced to quite a bit of rabies stuff because yeah, rabies is everywhere and hmm? um, brought any with you no rabies or things with <laughs> mm. bubonic plague yeah I probably know. the plague i carry okay. the plague around with me in my back pocket let's just see if i can find it yeah oh, there's plague here somewhere so just as a matter of interest plague broke out in two places in south africa initially and it was in 1900 this is and it was the black death basically. black death yes oh. is that rats is that politically correct no, no. <laughs> what well, it was called the Black Death in the 1600s. Black death in I think 1600. Was, yeah. Just be careful of those terms yeah, nowadays. Yeah. Yeah, so let's call it bubonic, bubonic plague, plague rather. Yeah. The plague. Yes. Yeah, so Black Death. Okay, so mm. what happened is in um, 1900 it broke out. Now, the interesting thing, it broke out in two places. Port Elizabeth, Cape Town. Okay. The reason it broke out is rats were brought with horse feed, blamed the empire okay. for oh, horses right, yes. for the Anglo-Boer War. Okay. And there was a station at Kucha, yeah. right? And in the Cape as well, in Cape Town. Yes. Right. So the horse feed was brought in, black rats came with it, they spread plague, we became plague endemic. So 
there's regular i've picked up plague samples fairly regularly now so I know exactly what to find, what to look. But the thing with plague is it's not that deadly nowadays yeah. because we've got good antibiotics to handle it. If you know what's going on and you treat it, you should be fine. Yeah. Okay. Unlike <laughs> rabies. Unlike okay, rabies. Yeah, yeah. Very much unlike I rabies. I seem to remember an outbreak in the 80s, which was hectic. Uh, uh, was, was it in How the 80s? How old are you? Oh, I remember the 80s. I was a teenager then. <laughs> no, you're but right. No, you're 100% correct. Yeah. There was an outbreak of plague in the 80s, yes. Yeah. And, and I, so, I remember seeing those, those pictures on TV, it was, it was quite uh, terrifying. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, so this stuff all lurks in the natural environment. So the problem is, is that I have to play two roles. I love saving wildlife. It's my hobby. I have great fun doing it. I see the most, I do the, I can't even tell you half the things and half the weird things that happen. And some days I go home and I shake my head and I think, huh, I don't know how I made it laugh today. <laughs> <laughs> and it happens quite often like it. I'm sure. You know, so... What kind of strange, okay, why, why are we there? Come on, what kind of strange animals have you picked up in the, in the urban areas? I mean, it's, I always think like, what? Okay, you, let me tell you one of my greats. That's quite, from quite some long time ago. Like right, so I get a phone call from the police. Yeah. There's a bush pig, <laughs> right, <laughs> in a garden in Kama Park. Just like, okay. So then they phone me again. There's a bush pig in the house now in Kama Park. <laughs> so... Yeah. It's, now, it's now 9 o'clock on a Sunday evening. So I get to this house and come apart, right? Yeah. The police lights are flashing. There's cops with R4 standing <laughs> on the wall. The owners of the house are outside the property, right? Yeah. So I said, no, bush pigs in the house. <laughs> no, not impossible. Eh? There are bush pigs all around. <laughs> yeah. So it's not an unusual thing. Oh, okay, well, let me go and have a look. Open the... Well, I didn't have to open the door. The door was wide open. Walked inside and there was a bush pig. Sitting on the couch watching TV. <laughs> I mean, can you make this stuff up? No, you can't. <laughs> right? The bush pig was sitting on the couch watching TV. So the guy, you know, I looked at this thing and I looked at him and I thought, pig, you someone's pet. So I scratched him behind the ear and a proper bush pig, not a okay. warthog or anything, a real okay. bush pig and a big one too. Yeah. Scratched him behind the ear like that. Yeah. And I said, hey, come, let's go. And he walked out behind me, quite happily following me. <laughs> You know, and you could just see the deflation. The cops let the so R4s domesticate. drop and they all climbed. Everyone went. and they, That was someone's pet that got up. But it was, it was hilarious at the time. I mean, you know, you come in and there's the pig sitting on the couch watching TV. Absolutely fascinated by TV. Well, well, is it good to domesticate it, something like that? I mean, that's a, it's a wild animal, isn't it? Uh, you know, things do happen and people end up with these animals. They end up with a little piglet, sometimes deliberately, sometimes just yeah. by accident. And they become really, really tame. And pigs, yeah. pigs are quite intelligent, so they, they can provide... <laughs> Great, but they do become dangerous as time goes by. And war dogs are particularly mean. A lot of people keep war dogs and domesticate them, but they mean buggers. So, you know, you've got to be careful. And, I mean, a war dog's got those things that are yeah. tusks that'll rip out your stomach. And then uh, another one that is quite funny was I got a phone call yeah. from someone in Seaview and they said, hey, there's a lynx in my garden. Eesh. I got there, looked at the lynx, and I said, listen, this is a tame lynx. Pick the cat up, put it under my arm. So I phoned Garnet, came to crack a calm again. Pox, hey Garnet, because Garnet liked Lynx in those days, long time ago. Found him and said, hey Garnet, I'm bringing you a Lynx. He said, no, that's fine, I'll keep it. So I was driving with the Lynx sitting on my lap, which was going pretty well because the Lynx was checking out the window. It was yeah. just on dark. Okay. Driving into crack calm game park. When I hit crack calm game park, what jumps up with a bloody hair in front of the bucky? Oh, well, needless to say, did that lynx go berserk? He tried to bail out the window, and then I lost all of that love for that lynx. All right. <laughs> uh, no, look, some of the things that happen are funny. Some of them are really, really sad. Yeah. Um, you know, I've had some really, really sad experiences with wildlife where you see the damage that humans are actually doing. And the other thing is you see the pure ignorance of humans. But we must, we must, we, you, if you can remember, you must, you must tell us about some of this because people need to know what to do in situations. And like, you know, like my rat situation was a small one, but, but uh, you know, there's so many, so many cases where, where maybe people do the wrong thing, you know? Okay, so what often happens is people find a young animal, something cute, sweet, furry, adorable. Yeah. And they want to behave like Almira, hug it, kiss it, hold it, fondle it, okay. feed it, whatever. The problem is a lot of animals are very, very specific in their diets. So the sad thing that happens many times, once the animal is at the point of death, take a guess what? Bring, bring, hello Arnold, I found this Yeah. How long have you had it? Now I've had it for five days, it looks a bit sick. And then of course you get it in the diets. Okay, so okay. the specialist care involved for some of the really rarer species. Yeah. Right. Okay. is specialist care. And the diet required for some of the rarest species 
is specialist art. Okay. You know, so that is that is often said to me because I get the most beautiful, got a beautiful Cape, young Cape, Cape Tallis art in with the people that had five days and they fed it in Cape Milk. Oh, no good. Man. No good for Cape Tallis artists. They're is very, very specific in their diets. So, you know, by the time you get the animal, it's dehydrated, it's, okay. you know, and even the best veterinary care and the best vets. And the other problem is a lot of people will take a wild animal and keep it. Yeah. But they won't take it to a vet. First of all, because they know they shouldn't have it. And second of all, they don't want to spend the money at a vet. Yeah. You know? And rightfully so, if you come into the vet with a wild animal you've been keeping, yeah. the vet's going to charge you for it. Mm -hmm. You know? So they will hold on to that animal for as long as possible. When, when it's really at death's door, then they bring it in and say, oh, look what I found. Yeah. You know? And then you just have to grit your teeth and say, yeah, okay, sure. Okay, yeah. okay not yeah. a problem. Good, well done, Godspeed, yeah. fairly well kind of thing. Shit. Feel like whacking them on here. Just remember yeah. one thing. You can never fix stupid. <laughs> you can never, ever fix stupid. You can help it along with a baseball bat, but you can never <laughs> fix it. <laughs> and that is, you know, people say I'm harsh with that, but I have to deal with And sometimes you just, they're just yeah. days when I get really aggravated. Yeah. You yeah. know, and unfortunately, I think, I don't necessarily agree with her political beliefs, but I don't know if you know of a... Um, woman called Melanie Favut, Dr. Uh, Favut's yes, granddaughter, yes, yes, member yes, of ANC, etc., etc. Et et yes. yeah, and yeah. she wrote a very interesting article once. She said her children said to her, they said, Mom, why are you not on Facebook? And she said, because social media gives a voice to ourselves. Yeah. <laughs> and it was a very, very true statement. So yeah. the problem is, you have a whole host of people out who have no clue what they're doing, but they become instant social media celebrities. Yeah. Yes. And people follow them like, you know, like yeah. it's biblical. Yeah. Now look at these people and they know what they're doing. In fact, I was never on social media and my former business partner said to me, Arnold, you're a fool because if you look at all of these idiots around, yeah. but get your name out there because you do a lot of stuff and, you know, half of the good things. So if you say to me why you're on social media, I'll tell you straight. Yeah. Because I have a great passion for birds of prey. And the one thing I don't like is birds of prey ending up in these little roadside zoos to entertain the public. Mm -hmm. That is my main passion. So I love releasing them. I love, yeah. I can work with them. It's something I've done for 35 years and nothing gives me greater it's appreciation. It's a raptor, a raptor project that you're okay. doing as well, eh? Huh? Yeah, um, the urban raptor project is yeah. the business side. Wildline okay. is the rescue of the wildlife. Wild, okay. So, okay. And wildline is a lot of urban wildlife. I do get called all over the Eastern Cape, anything from blue cranes, martial eagles, you name it, I go. Wow. So yeah, I get lots of calls on those things and those are the things I enjoy doing. I saw a photo of a of, of huge wingspan of, of a, um, it was a bird of prey, but it was stuck in the electrocuted. Right? Yes, that was a, 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 a juvenile marshal that was electrocuted wow. at, um, well, that's another tragic circumstance. Yeah. So you look at that power line running across the salt marsh. Salt marsh, is that where it was? Uh, uh, Tankatara next to Sunday's River. Sunday's River, okay. Right, so you've got this beautiful salt marsh. Yeah. Blue crane settle in. Fantastic. Yeah. There were never many there. Now they're forming a nice breeding okay. flock. Right. So guess what happens? The power line just takes them out. One after that. Really? Then it takes out the and busted. Simple thing to repair. Yeah. Simple thing. Put flappers on, do the necessary yeah. stuff. Municipality not interested. A lot of people talking, a lot of hot air. We'll sort it out. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Now, we get a critically, remember, marshals are critically endangered. Like yeah. secretary birds, they are critically endangered. Marshal population has just dropped. Oh, yeah. Because the big problem is marshals wander over such a wide area and are. Uh, Tracking of the one marshal I rehabilitated showed us. Yeah. He wandered from now right into Lesotho, over into the Free State, all over. So they wander over such a wide yeah. area that they're not contained by national parks. It's not like a marshal lives in one cliff in a national park. He goes right out the yeah, national park. He goes wherever he wants to go. Yeah. And, um, you know, yeah. so they are really hammered. So to find a beautiful female in perfect health, young bird, oh, this yeah. past year's chick, nuked on the power line. Evidently, they've been warned now they're going to get an environmental non-compliance. But if you look at our municipality, just puts raw sewage straight into the sea. Do you think it's going to worry them? Yeah. I wonder. Let's see. Wow, man. And, and, and how do we, I mean, it, if this, I mean, because that's, that's just one, one thing you need to do, you know. And I, I suppose it's a little, if you, if you want to attack this problem of, uh, of the people not really giving a crap about or government really, uh, you know, seemingly, seemingly oblivious to what's going on or, or not really caring too much. Mm. Uh, how do we, if we see this happening, how do we, um, how, how do we change it? How do we try and change little bit by little bit, you know? Perhaps that power line is the first one. We try and, try and get a... a, a well, we've got to, look, my problem is I'm far too thinly spread. Right, that's my problem. And one thing people need to remember, this kind of stuff, this is a hobby. 
It's not, a, I've got to earn a living as well. So yeah. I've got to do all of the stuff yeah. in between earning a living. Yeah, there are yeah. many nights that I don't finish feeding or looking after things till 10, 11 o'clock at night. Then I still get up early the next morning to yeah. go and do other stuff. So, yeah. you know, when I look at all of this stuff, I will let it go for so long and then I'll say, well, you know, you're not going to get it right. Now I will take it by the ball. Okay. And there's certain things that we need as citizens of the city to take by the balls yeah. and give them a good squeeze. Yeah. Barkins River, sewerage yes. flows, yes. dumping of raw sewerage. It is absolute you-know-what. Yeah. And it goes on and on and on. The municipality okay. needs to be prosecuted. There's yeah. enough environmental law to prosecute this municipality. Yeah. People will not do it. That's yeah. the problem. So sooner or later, when I get peed off enough, I will go to a police station and I will yeah. open criminal cases against a couple of people yeah. and let's see what happens. Yeah. But other citizens should be doing the same because yeah. I'm a citizen now. I'm no longer an official working for yeah. the government. I'm a citizen. Yeah. So people need to do that. We as citizens need to take an aggressive stance when it comes to environmental matters. Yeah. You know? yeah. And it is sometimes, and I'm talking about real environmental issues. You know, yeah. Yeah. Not, oh, you know, I don't like what's happening. I mean, if we look at the, you know, Ask me what depresses me the most. It's the sewage in the water and the yeah. dumping of waste. It yeah. is frightening. I have yeah. witnessed some of the most beautiful flays and wetlands turned into rubbish dumps. Yeah, the dumping, Why? illegal dumping. It's ridiculous. I, I just, I don't get it. I've set up a camera here in, in, in the valley over here because it's, it is, there's a dumping going on over here. Just a small, little small scale thing. But people will come into the valley and just dump. And, and, and I mean, you know, there's so many reasons. Why this happens as well, you've got to s almost step back and look at that big picture again, you know, like, like you, you have to do that in, in so many cases. You have to step back from, from everything and look at, at the entire picture. I mean, there's a, there's a guy dumping here, he's obviously a drug addict or something, and, you know, that, then, then there's a whole, there's a whole uh, other uh, clump of reasons why, that, why it happens. Um, but if you step back and look at the bigger picture, like, like um, in your case, you, you have to exterminate anim animals as well and, and, and do away with them. It, it, you, you know, Gina, you, you have to look at the big picture. So now I have to provide solutions to problems. Yeah. Right. So I look at the species that occur in the urban areas. Yeah. Right. And my good friend, Dr. Matt, always says to me, you know, Arnold, what the saddest thing, and he's very right, yeah. the species that do well, yeah. we call problems. Oh, we should be praising them and saying, listen, you've done well, guys. Yeah. You deserve a medal, but instead they become problems. So when I look at the city, there are a couple of species that I regard as distinct problem species. Yeah. Egyptian geese. Really? Right. So Philippa's why? Philip is going to hate that one because she had lovely little Egyptian geese. Oh, please. But I've raised by thousands of them. I love them. They're cute. They're entertaining. But let me tell you one thing about Egyptian geese that very few people don't know. Yes. I got a phone call the other day from a school. Right, they say, Arnold, can you help? So I said, What happened? No, they had a pair of Egyptian geese and they had youngsters. Yeah. Youngsters got into the pool, yeah. right? Another pair of Egyptian geese came and they killed all those youngsters just like that. Egyptian geese are extremely aggressive, really, right? So, one of my big problems is they keep attacking the owls in the nest boxes, oh, right. Okay. They are bold enough to try and the only birds of mine in my raptor nest boxes can withstand Egyptian geese. Or the peregrine falcons. They can take them on in a fair. But birds like rock kestrels and that, they throw the eggs, throw the chicks out, and they take over the nest boxes. So now you look at Egyptian geese. If you went back 30 years, very few Egyptian geese. What's changed? All of the agricultural land suits them. Yeah. Their aggressive nature, because they take over a single body of water, yeah. and they then proceed, and they will kill other ducks, other ducklings and that. They will take over that water, and they just dominate. And their capacity to breed, their breeding is never endless. There's no breeding season for Egyptians anymore. They breed oh, the yeah. whole year round. Sure. So every time you look, there's 12 goslings. Now the sad thing is, sweet and kind humans. Yeah. Oh, look at that. Let's throw some millies. Yes. Let's feed them. Let's keep them going. So what happens? Instead of nature yeah. sorting them out to a degree where when you have 12 babies, very few of them should survive. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But... No, they're raising eight and ten youngsters, and now we've got, instead of one or two babies a year surviving, and not only that, they're double clutching because there's yeah. lots of food in that, yeah. so now we've got 20, 30 babies. Double so clutching. as a result, we're sitting with five 
six, seven, eight hundred Egyptians in a flock. Yeah. So, okay, so now you have oh, to look, now you've got to look at like the much bigger picture. Now we're talking about the city. So all over, all of these dairy farms and that have thousands and thousands of geese coming in. Right. Okay. So if you look in America, one of their big problems with their water reserves is the vast amounts of geese yeah. defecating in the water because yes. they virtually pollute that water to the yeah. extent that it's non-drinkable. So they have to have active elimination programs 24-7 to control the geese numbers. Holy you crap. Know? Okay. So the problem is you can love animals as much as you want to, but you also have to be realistic and we have to control numbers in a lot of species because not only are they negative to us, but they're negative to other wildlife species. Yeah. They're negative to the environment. So now we look at crows. Yeah. Highly entertaining. Yes. Except it's you've got black a black one, bag of yeah. rubbish ripped all over the place. Have a yeah. look at something else about crows. Yeah. What do they do? They mob and attack all other birds. Really? Right. So what happens is you get a flock of crows. They'll find a young owl. They'll beat it to death. They'll kill it and eat it. They have no problem doing that. They do it often. I get called how many times? Owl wings smashed by crows. Crows ripping along. Owl chick they've caught. They've beaten off the parents. They take it. Why have we got so many crows? Because of all of the waste. The yeah. worse the waste management gets, the okay. more the crows are. Right? Yeah. So now we sit with this problem. And what happens? What is the right way to do it? You've got to control them. So yeah. what do some idiots say? Western Cap, well, the crows are a big problem. They're affecting a lot of other birds. We'll have to put out poison for them. Aye. Exactly. Yeah. That yeah. old crude fabric. Crows numbers have to be mm. controlled. Mm. I found them highly entertaining. I rescued one... Oh. Yeah. I call him Jimmy the Saint. It's one of those white neck ravens. If you ever seen the size of the, if you ever see the size of the the beak on that thing, I tell you, it's quite impressive. It's about the size of my hand, literally. They massive birds. They are big. I mean, there's, there's, there's about six So you get the pied crow, uh, you get the black crow, and you get the white neck raven. And the white neck raven's massive. He's oh, really? the big guy. He's virtually pitch black, and you'll see he's got a white collar around oh, his wow. neck. Oh wow! Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. But he's I a mean, mean bird. I think those. I think there's there's some of those up here in the valley as well. I've, I've, See, they're, they're, and, they're, and they're about six of them. Is that yeah. they're going in groups? Or? Yeah. So, yeah. you know, and the other interesting thing is crows, anywhere vultures feed, are a major menace. They mob the vultures and they actually mob them off the carcasses oh, really? because there's so many of them. So they're actually having a negative impact on vultures as well, and vulture feeding. Yeah. So, you know, it's all of these things, all created by humans. So you have to say to him, Arnold, what's the right answer? Well, we need to cull humans. But either this whole flu scam was such a joke because we needed to lose a couple of billion, not, not what was it, one or two million or well, something worldwide. Yeah, but, but I mean, this uh, COVID certainly had an effect on, on, the, uh, on the society, the animal welfare and, the, and, and all the other um, um, animal uh, charities and things. Okay, so if you look at me, when, when this whole COVID thing started, now, I love people that talk about follow the science and the science and love. Mm. All of a sudden, science became a big buzzword, wasn't mm. it? Everyone was all out there for science. Yeah. Well, you know, I've kind of worked in the background with these virus things and bubonic plague. And so I yeah, yeah. mingled in those communities. So I know yes. a lot of the stuff. Dabble in it. Dabble in it. Dabble in it. I dabble in it. I mean, you know, the odd bit of plague, yeah, a little yes. bit of this, yeah. Send some viral <laughs> samples. The there. Well, it's quite interesting. <laughs> The hilarious thing was the first week of COVID, I had a fruit bat that I wanted sample. Yeah. So I sent an email up yeah. and I said, I've got a fruit bat yeah. that I need sample. Now, you know, the whole theory was sample, COVID though, was... But even by sample. Do you well, know, I want, you know, I want blood brain blood. sample. I actually want to test for viral malaria. Oh, because it seems like fruit bats can be carriers of viral malaria. Anyway, so I'm going to test it, etc. Et so I said, I've got this fruit bat. Now, you know, that whole COVID thing started, well, it could come from bats. Yeah. Oh, and right. the, the, the bat, I said, yes. the bat was sick, it had certain symptoms, etc. Yeah. Jesus, it was just dead silence. So then I thought, no, bugger, this has been a day, now I need to phone. So I phoned the yeah. head scientist and I said, listen, I've got a fruit bat that needs sampling. Yeah. It was just dead silence. <laughs> You know, it was like Satan himself had come into our midst. I said, I've got a fruit bat. It's just a damn fruit bat. I know it's weird, but please sample it. I'm going to send it up. Well, I'll come here on, Woody. It was absolutely hilarious because this whole world went into a panic yeah, yeah. about this thing that was going to kill us all, yeah, yeah. you know, which unfortunately didn't because we do need to get culled quite a bit. Yes. Like a lot of other populations. <laughs> so because we are the, the biggest problem. We need problem. human culling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's but, nice, yeah. it's okay. but you, you know it's interesting because 
having dealt with all of these schemes and a lot of the environmental schemes and scams, you know, so yeah, yeah. let's go to raptor friendly and eco friendly yes. poison, etc., etc. Now you look yes. with a bit of a jaundice, jaundice eye at everything, so now yeah. COVID comes along. Yeah. This is going to kill so many people. We're on the verge of death. Anyway, the, yeah, yeah. The, the sweet thing was for the first couple of weeks, I mean, I had free access. Doing what I do, I could go anywhere. Yeah. Lockdown oh, yes. didn't mean no, anything lockdown, in my yeah. world. Lockdown. Lockdown. Yeah. You know, forget about that crap. <laughs> for you plebs. Yes. So the first, the first thing is, is that it was wonderful to see wildlife come out again. I was on the roads at night. There was nobody. They yeah. were deserted. And right. so, so, so that, I remember that that that, that was definitely. That was it was cool. Yeah. It was really cool. I started to see animals around. Yeah. You know there was a, a mountain reed back here in DF Malaba School. Yes. Yeah. You know so it was really nice. So I went down to Third Avenue Dip, and there every evening I saw my friendly owl. Yeah. And the most amazing thing I saw was him catch a puff adder. Yo. Awesome. Caught a puff adder and killed it. It was so amazing that I didn't even think to take a video. I just watched it. I yeah. could not believe how beautifully he killed that puff adder. Yeah. And he sat in the middle of the road and ate it. <laughs> And no cost. Take a guess what? Yeah. The first time they lifted restriction yeah. that very evening was knocked over and killed yeah, in the road there. Yeah. The owner at the cafe at the top said, Arnold, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been knocked over. Uh, and I went and collected yeah. him, he was knocked over. Uh, so that was the sad thing. But I said from the start that this COVID thing is going to have a negative impact. Yeah. You need to understand that in our world and our country, mm. there are a lot of really poor people. Mm. We've yeah. now made them poorer, we've made them hungrier. Who's going to pay the price? Wildlife. Yeah. Third week in COVID, I'm driving along near Bridgemead. I see two little guys. They're carrying a bag on their back. And I can see the bags moving. Hey. Right. Call them over. Hey, what you carrying here? Yeah. Tortoises. Tortoises. Tortoises from this peak through. Take uh, them home to eat. No. And you know, I looked at the whole thing. And then I looked at the arrogance of some people. When I say arrogance, you know, yeah, you have people. They're sitting in their beautiful houses next mm. to their swimming pool. And they're berating the poor. Oh, look at those people. They're not even practicing lockdown. They're all together. Mm. You know, what do you expect? And this whole thing has continued to have that impact. But the sad impact was that we had government departments tasked with protecting the environment that we were doing little before. Now they had an excuse for two years to do nothing. Yeah. And the environment has paid the price. It has paid the price hands down. We won't even talk about the animals that are entangled with masks and the birds we get in and the seabirds yeah. and all of that. We will not masks. talk about I saw, it. I saw that uh, a, a raptor with a mask underneath yeah. its wing. Yeah, rock kestrel. You see the juveniles will chase something like a mask blowing around, then it gets tangled yeah. up, the next thing it's tangled up in that, and that's yeah. it. Yeah. You know, so, yeah, I, I just, I, I just, I know my world's out there in a real world, and I see a lot of things. And, you know, I deal with this kind of stuff. And I know people are, are, are just very easily fooled and misled. And yeah. you can tell them anything and they will believe it. And they'll believe it. And they'll fight till the end of you days. You give money to pl places that, that uh, yeah. and, and you, you've, got to, you've got to make sure where you, where you give Well, this is the, this is the big thing, you well. know. Um, people also tend to believe, and this is where animal rights organizations score hands down. Because they appeal. They have the most amazing heart-rending pictures and stuff, and they appeal to people, and people yeah. spend their money. But you know what is interesting to me? Let's take Save the Rhino. Yeah. If you look at any of the Save the Rhino things, I can tell you about 99% of the money that you donate in Save, Save the Rhino goes to pay inflated salaries and things like that. Very little actually goes to Save the Rhino. Mm. And there are tons of those things out everywhere. I remember a couple of places that said, oh, given this, and I said, you know, have you looked, what are they actually doing? Yeah. And we can go and talk. Do your research on it, I suppose. You've got to do something. We, we can go and talk on my favorite topic. So, when you say to me, Arnold, what are the most endangered things? It's not rhino and elephant. Where do people come from? It's not rhino and elephant. It's tiny, insignificant little creatures that aren't cute, that aren't funny, yeah. that aren't pretty, and nobody gives a continental about yeah. them. Those are the things that are dying right under our eyes. They're going. They're going at a rate of knots. Rhino, they're worth too much money. They're property. Mm. They'll be around. But it's those little guys that nobody worries about that are just as spring. The tiny little mm -hmm. plants, the insects, the things that have no financial value. Do those are the, the ones the that The plants go. and stuff, plant life as well. I mean, it must be a similar similar thing. Uh, Gary, Gary puts on a little notes every now and again. No, just ignore it. That's just for me. So when yeah. he's saying, the, the, there was, we, was, we was talking earlier about a, a, a monkey that was, was like 40 foot up in the air on a crane. Okay. What is that? So, you know, this is now... So I do all this wildlife rescue and I save all these animals. But there is a side where I have to make decisions. Now, I've got to make decisions based on what's best for humans and animals. Yeah. And this was a classic example that I was telling. So yesterday I get a phone call. Yeah. There is an aggressive male monkey. Yeah. Right. And he's trapped four people. Yeah. 
on top of the crane. In a crane. So the there's crane. a box in the crane. The box in the crane. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So, you know, I'm used to dealing with this kind of stuff. Yeah. It's a monkey. Really, it's yeah. a monkey. Let's go. Yeah. But I've also seen the damage a big malvervet can do. Yeah. I've seen a person's muscle in the arm almost ripped out by a big yeah. malvervet. So I'm teeth. worried. They've got nice big teeth. And they mean as well. Don't yeah, yeah, ever yeah. underestimate them. We'll go into another baboon story okay, after this. Yeah, yeah. So off I go and I'm, gonna, I'm just going to you know, shoo the monkey away. Yeah. Well, let me tell you one thing. That monkey attacked me straight away. Really? Yeah. The problem is, is he had been so used to being fed by people. Yeah. And when someone said, no, you're not coming out to attack. You need to understand primate psychology. So mm -hmm. if you're in this whole little family and you're all sitting along there and here comes big boy. Mm -hmm. yeah, I yeah. like what you're eating. Whoops, I'll have it. Yeah. No, I'm not going to give it to you. Okay, well, I'll give you a good bite then. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And when humans start feeding them, so what happens is, he's the big man. So now you come, oh, yeah, have a little banana. Oh, that's yeah. nice. Now this human's scared of me. I'm the boss here now. Yeah. So when he doesn't get what he wants, then he starts to become mean. Mm -hmm. So now I've got to look at the situation. So we're talking 30, 40 meters up, yeah. right? We've got people. Now, if they start coming down, yeah. right, and that monkey attacks them, and someone falls, which is perfectly feasible, yeah. Yeah. falls to their death, Who's going to be responsible? Yeah. In the meantime, there's a whole troop of vervets that live in that area. Yeah. You know? Yeah. What is going to happen? If someone falls to their death because of a vervet monkey, every single monkey in that troop will have to be killed. They yeah. will insist on it. And I, you can't blame them, rightfully so. Yeah. Vervets are not endangered. They're very common species. right? And they're a problem species in a lot of areas. So yeah. I have to make those calls, which are sometimes brutal. I felt sorry for him because, yeah. you know, it's not really his fault. Yeah. Right? But I also have to say, well, you know, if someone falls to their death because of this monkey, and he really was aggressive. Yeah, yeah. yeah and, you know, yeah, I, told, I told you the story of the baboon. So yeah. I get a phone call from the district commissioner. Yeah. And he says, hey, Arnold, this is a baboon in town. Yeah. Okay. Right? And I ignored it. P yeah, in P. P well, yeah, I ignored okay. it because I always do that. I just ignore it. And I yes. hope that he goes away somewhere yeah, else. Okay. You know, and goes and okay. finds his own little yes. whatever and just disappears out of sight. Because I know the end's never going to be pleasant. You know? Yeah, yeah. So eventually, after two days, the district commissioner found me. He says, Arnold, he says, the baboon just went through a play school. Yeah. Right? Okay. You ought to come now and shoot it. Right? Okay. So off I go. Shoot the baboon. Yeah. Clean shot, clean kill. He didn't even know he was dead. He was showing me he was sitting on a roof. I'll never forget. Sitting there quietly. Shot him through the head. Stone dead. No problem. Yeah. Take the baboon away. Now, of course, every single bunny hug and animal rights person is up in arms. Yeah. You know, oh, how could you do that? It's brutal. It's cruel. Mm. Right. First of all, obviously, I have a permit to do it. I was asked by the area commissioner. There's not even a legal it's problem, legal. even though some people allegedly try to open case, and they, they can do that kind of stuff. Yeah. I know what I'm doing is right. Yeah. Point of the matter is, take a guess what happened a year later. A year yeah. later, on a friend of mine's brother's farm in Natal, yeah. a baboon actually killed a young child. Yeah. Well, they're bloody so strong. I mean, they're, they're strong and they strong. mean. And the problem is, you have to make those kinds of decisions. And yeah. people, you have all of these... You know, I told you the Elmira Fudd syndrome. I want to love, I want to hug, I want to cuddle, yeah, yeah. I want to kiss, I want to hold this thing. Yeah. There's always that continuous line between humans and wildlife. Yeah. And I've got to treat both sides of that line. Sometimes I've got to make a decision based on what's better for humans and sometimes for animals. Yeah. And it's a very difficult thing for me sometimes because I'm not a very people kind of person. As far yeah. as I'm concerned, my greatest sadness was that COVID didn't do its job properly. <laughs> You know, it's a bit of a letdown. You know, one of those things, really a letdown. We needed to lose a couple of billion. What have we lost? Virtually nothing. You know, so there's not even a negligible. And probably with all of these people lying at home doing nothing, there's probably more babies born now than ever. So we're you actually know, on a positive population growth, which is world, very negative probably. for the world. But so you anyway. have rather more. The animals were growing and the humans were growing. That's good. That's good for Arnold. <laughs> but, 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 you know, you've got, to, you've, got to look at the, you've got to look at the big picture. And, yeah. you know, the big picture is is that you cannot manage wildlife yeah. without controlling it. Yeah. And there's some species we need to protect to ensure their survival. There are other species we need to control, often not just for humans' benefit, but to protect other indigenous species so they can survive and thrive. Yeah. And it is a very, very fine balance. Mm -hmm. And I often, you know, I look at things and I just wish I could be so wear these rose-tinted glasses and look at life simply. I'll give you a classic example. So... Schools have a lot of problems with pigeons. Okay, yes, yes. Right, so everyone says, Arnold, bring in a raptor. It's not possible to, yeah. to, to fly hawks every day and chase They're pigeons. They're not going to listen to you. No, they? they don't listen. <laughs> you know, the, the point of the matter is pigeons are pretty sharp. And that's why they're one of the most invasive species. No, feral pigeons. Mm -hmm. So now you sit with a problem, right? You've got a school. 
right? They've got children, they're young children, right? You've got bird lice falling on them all day. Do you yeah. think? Do you think it's right? Yeah. Do you think it's right to say now, oh, well, you know, that, leave those pigeons alone. You know, it's just bird life, doesn't really matter. Yeah. You don't have a minor health hazard. You know, leave those pigeons alone. Or do they need to be controlled? They're feral invasive species. They need to be controlled. Yeah. That's it. There's not a negotiable factor on that. Another instance, I get a call from a school. We've got bats in the tree. Now, bats and I yeah. have a great love relationship. Oh, I right. love bats. Okay. I love anything that makes humans feel creepy and bats are one of them <laughs> you know there's no you hear people screaming and you have come little bat along wheeling wailing yeah <laughs> so i get a phone call from a school same thing well you got bats in the tree i looked at them and i said hey you just leave those bats alone they present no threat to you or the yes. kids there's no health risk they're outside they Wahlberg's epileptic fruit bat, lovely colony, take the kids and give them some environmental lessons with those bats. Lovely. You just leave them alone. Do you understand the difference? Yeah. But I can't go and do that when someone says, hey Arnold, we've got a problem with pigeons. feral pigeons, we've got lice all over the place, yes, yes, we've got a feces thing. Yeah. yeah, you know, those birds need to be controlled. That's it. Mm. So it is a very, very difficult thing sometimes for me mm. to play both roles. But it's a job that has to be done. And in the instance of that monkey, yeah. I saved the whole of that troop. Yeah. By taking him out and his aggression and that, another troop leader will maybe will be aggressive one day, but in the meantime, yeah. that troop will carry on and people will, yeah. will leave them alone. So that's the big you know? picture. Is that, is that, is that I've always got to look at a much one. bigger picture than, than, yeah. than just that thing. And, yeah. you know, it is very, very difficult because animal rights are a very emotive issue, which is why mm -hmm. I believe in animal welfare. Yeah. You know, if animal rights people had their way, nobody would ride horses, nobody would do anything, and animals would be worshipped almost like demigods. Yeah. I believe that animals need to be looked after, they need not to be treated cruelly, right? Mm -hmm. People need to be kind to their animals and look after them really well. Mm -hmm. And you know, I have a big problem with cats. So I have a really big problem with cats. Mm -hmm. But I've got a confession to make. Yeah. There's not one of these cat lovers that has more cats than I do that I've rescued and haven't had the heart to have put down. <laughs> the, other, the other day, right, but yeah. you know what the difference is? The difference is I'm putting my money where my mouth is and I'm building a big cat tree because I cannot have cats free ranging and killing all wildlife. Yeah. So if I like cats, there's a price I pay. They have a big cat tree to live in. Okay. They can come into the house, but they don't go into the garden. Right. That's it, end of story. But that day, I got a call for a warehouse, massive cat problem. So they asked me to look at it, what do I suggest? Yeah. So I said, have you spoken to the cat people? No, they'd spoken to them. So they found a whole um, heap of kittens. Yeah. And I said, what's going and they said, no, they said, we'll just put them back in the factory. I said, you know, whoever said that a factory is a place to have cats? Factories with people and <laughs> containers and uh, well, yeah. forklifts racing around. That's not a place you keep domestic animals. But you see, because people will not accept responsibility and say, we need to take all those cats out and euthanize them, they don't actually belong in factories. Yeah. It's not kind, it's not good, it's not anything. They don't belong there. But... No, I just put that whole batch of kittens. I took the kittens home, had them inoculated, treated and just, I got one or two friends and they took yeah, them yeah. and I kept two. Because I felt sorry for them. <laughs> you know, but the point yeah. of the matter is, is even though I like cats, yeah. they cause way too much damage for wildlife. And every time I look at my Bengal, because I've got a beautiful Bengal male, but he's a murderer. Yeah. You know, there's no ways I can ever let him out yeah. with a clear conscience because yeah. I know every bird will be gone. I spend yeah. so much time trying to encourage yeah. birds into my garden. You know, naturally, yeah. which can go back to another thing, is yeah. people, humans like instant gratification. Yeah. So we always want this, you know, I want to see a result straight away. Yeah. I don't want to wait yeah, yeah. a couple of years for a result it's I want the to The internet die. generation. It's true, yeah. Exactly. So feeding birds. Oh, feeding birds. Okay. We love feeding birds. Oh, look at yes. this. I've got 55 yes. different species coming to my bird feeder. Yes. What's wrong about bird feeding? encourages rats do you know that 98 percent? are you feeding birds in your garden be honest i have fed, be, be honest i've been known to feed birds in ah my garden look at you feet. blushing eh there we go caught out <laughs> no, you got no. a rat problem eh it's my the wife rat that's doing it it's her it's her oh no not me <laughs> okay so what happens is if you put a camera up by your bird feed at night you'll find house rats hanging on there eating what is a house rat what? a gervous seed eater right so I'll catch those bastards <laughs> problem is you bring in them you're yeah. feeding them. What happens within the animal population? When you feed it, it breeds. Now you like birds, so you won't put out 
poison. Yes. Uh, yeah, no. What do you think your neighbor's going to do who doesn't mind putting out poison? No, what happens? Know. All your owls, all your other predators in the area get poisoned. Why? Because we need instant gratification. We don't take cognizance of the fact that bird feeders spread disease. In the wild, no bird all comes and sits on exactly same the same thing. place and feeds. So every disease gets spread. And who are the people that say, oh, I've got 20 dead birds in my garden. Are you feeding birds? Yes, I'm feeding birds. Why do you yeah. think you've got 20 dead birds? Yeah. You've got so much disease, yeah. you're not a bird feeder. The only way to really have a bird feed is take it down five times a day, spray it off with F10, clean off all of that yeah. stuff, etc. And no matter what feed you've got, birds waste. And they throw that seed out and at night the rats are there. So, you know, when you tell people that, yeah. right? Yeah. They're like, oh, yeah, how can you start? And I said, no. Do you know what happens? So we get a lot of birds in, a lot of seed eaters and stuff. You get them in their nests. Yeah. Right? What is that nest? That nest is lined with seeding grass. Why? That's how that bird learns to eat. Mm-hmm. So the parents come back, they bring a whole grass seed head, they put it in there. That bird learns to strip the seed off the grass seed head. Okay. What happens when a bird gets taught to go to a feeder? Takes the youngster, takes it back to the feeder. Oh, look, this is where you find yeah. food. Tick, tick, tick. Not pull off those Easy. seed heads and that kind of stuff. Yeah. So bird feeding is very detrimental to birds. The right way to do it, the way I do it, plant indigenous trees, they flower, mm-hmm. fruit, seed, let them come and forage. And the go- I was looking at my garden this afternoon. Crossberries are there. Oh, the trees are full of birds harvesting crossberries and that. The right way to do it. Okay. Putting out bird seed, it's an old instant gratification. It brings rats. And with rats comes poison. And with poison, all your owls go west. And that is one of the saddest things. Again, it's one of those human failings where I can't really... Well, people like to think it's drought and they're feeding these birds and keeping them alive. But drought, you know what nature's about. It's about survival of the fittest. So when a drought time comes, it doesn't kill all the birds. It's just the very best, the very cleverest, and those are the ones that survive. Right? So... Sure. All we need to do is provide water, provide some good indigenous flowering plants, seeds, berries, etc. that the birds can actually feed on. Yeah. Right? And you know what's interesting? Bird feeders attract a lot of pigeons. Yes. Right? Which is one of the reasons for the ever-expanding pigeon population, which brings yeah. its own problem. Yeah, yeah. Right? And with natural fruit in that, you barely ever see pigeons harvesting. Only green fruit pigeons which are moving to town. Yeah, yeah. You ask me why I feel so passionate about the environment. Yeah. If I look in my time now in the past 20 years, I've seen 11 local extinctions of animals that have become extinct that once occurred in our urban area, wow. which is very, very sad yeah. to me, you know. And, and they're, they're uh, specific to the area, isn't it? No, no, yeah, they're found in other areas. Area. But these were species that occurred within our okay. metro area, which have now become extinct because yeah. of various pressures, be it pollution, yeah. Bed hunting and the other pressure where it comes on me a lot is with all of the pressure in the Balkans Valley, all of the hunting and stuff, a lot of wildlife is pushed out of the Balkans into the suburbs. Yeah, so you get people finding and say, oh, I've got an otter in my garden, yes, an otter I've got a bush, and yeah, in Wombley. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, well, that wasn't even nice because that was actually chased by dogs, that's why I was up there. A chased by dogs, yeah, uh, that's why it was up Sixth there. Avenue, yeah, yes, chased mm. by dogs, oh, my unfortunately. Word. Well, Cape Otters make a good account for themselves. I can tell you a great story about Cape Road. Yeah. <laughs> One Friday night, I get a phone call Arnold, we've got a Cape Otter in my garden, sure. right? This isn't Cape Road, main okay. Cape Road. Yeah. So I said, Okay, I'll come and catch it now. By the time it took me probably about 15 minutes to get there because I had to get a big cage strap, etc., etc. 15 minutes later, it went through five gardens. And you know how I know it went through five gardens? Because every garden had put a dog at the vet. Ching, <laughs> ching, really? ching. Oh they were just, there was just a line of dogs going to the vet as it sorted. So big Cape Claws Otter weighs about 25 k. He's got a mean set of fangs on him. Yeah. And he doesn't back down for a good barney. He yeah. loves a good barney. <laughs> so, you know, and then very well known to kill dogs are going to the water and that often. But unfortunately, they can't manage a pack of dogs. Yeah, of so, you know, when you get these packs that come into the Balkans with yeah. these guys poaching, the otters don't, mm. don't do well. Yeah, so yeah. it's massive pressure, but that's the kind of stuff I deal with yeah. a lot. So oh. I cannot even tell you the, the things that happen because people like fun, you know, people love exaggerating. So they'll phone and say, I've got this massive snake. Now you're expecting <laughs> something like something out of the movie, yes, Anaconda, yes, and this little quiver. thing sitting there quivering. Yes. Point of the matter is one day I get a guy and he phones me. He says, oh. he says oh, I've got a buck in my garden. No, you know, buck, buck, Christ buck, yeah, yeah. maybe a grey duck, Christ buck right next to Balkan. Yeah. I get there and I kid you not, it's a full-grown bushbuck ram. Now, you know, bushbuck rams yeah. don't stand back for anything. Okay. Well, Might let me be. tell you, he made me sweat. <laughs> he really made me sweat catching him. 
But uh, yeah. Well, it's lovely to know that these, these they do come down and, and and we see it every now and again, uh, you know, by coming through through the valley and we, and we in the middle of all, you know, So it's it's uh, they obviously make know, their way down. You know what the sad thing was? There were bushbuck all over here. A couple of years ago, they were all over here. If you drove carefully and looked, you would see them from the road, standing and feeding in the morning yeah. sun. And there, those buck are all gone. Gone now. This area is poached to hell. Uh, it really is poached. And it started sure. with COVID, and nobody's doing anything about it. See, my wife is asking questions now that she's been uh, called out for feeding the birds. Is, uh, is it wrong to have an owl breeding box near your garden? Okay, so a lot of people ask me about owl nest boxes. So if you. Go to the whole Al Nesbok story. It's a very romantic story. Yes. It seems nice. Yes. Right? So, 20... How long is 98 ago? 98 is 24 years ago. Jeez. 24 okay. years ago, young 24 man. Years, <laughs> 24 years ago, I put up the first rack the nest box in town. That was long okay. before Al Nest Boxes were the vogue. Okay. Right. So, already I'd been experimenting with that. And a lot of people... Have been fed the idea. I should put up an owl nest box in one of our rack problem. Yeah. It's part of a solution, right? Okay. But if you're in a circumstance where the owls already have a very good nest site, yeah. now you know that 23, 24 years ago, most eagle owls bred in the ground. Oh. Yeah. Okay. And those are interesting concept. Eh? Those that bred in the ground have eventually been wiped out by dogs and people, okay. and we get more of them that breed in yeah, trees yeah. now. Yeah. So the barkins, most of my nests in the barkins were on the ground at the base of a tree. Wow. Okay. So when owls have a really good nesting site, yeah. they're not going to come and hop into your box and say, oh, well, you know, God, I like oh, this okay. place. But it works very well in the circumstance maybe we don't have nice big trees close by yeah. because I've seen them attached on the side of... I've got... In Lorraine, I've got three attached to the side of buildings there and they've okay. all got uh, owls that breed in them every year. Okay. So you can attach yeah. it to the side of a building quite high up or that. But if you've got really big old dead trees, the owls... Uh, I'm not going to just come wandering to well, your We've got box. an oak tree here, which we put well up, up in the oak tree. You can, but, yeah, you but, can, uh, you can put I it up. It's, it's, I know it's been, it's been there for ages, but no bloody owls have come near it. Because, that, <laughs> yo, are you hearing owls? Uh, yeah, we do, we do. Okay, well, then we they've do. got a good sight, so they're not going to okay. use your sight. You know, along, yeah, they would probably use the, they, the cliff faces and that, yeah, are really yeah, nice. Yeah, they were probably yeah. breeding there. Yeah, so, right, nice. if you want to hear a good story about an owl, Old guy phones me, I want to put up an owl nest box. Yeah. So I give him, you know, that classic information. Get it up as high as you can, four or five meters yeah. up. Put the box, face it the right way, etc., right. etc. Yes, what's the one right way to face Okay, it? yeah, face yeah. it. starting in the prevailing weather, okay, bloody, yes, bloody, yes. blah. Okay. A year later, I get a phone call from old guy. I've got my box up, but one of the babies is sick. Will you come and have a look? Oh. I kid you not. He put the box up. I don't even think it was a meter off the ground. The damn owl's bred in it. After me giving all of those careful instructions, five meters up, face it out the window, he puts it on the ground almost, and the owls hop in there breeding it. I was so disgusted with those birds, really. That's the problem with animals. You know know when you know you know nothing about wildlife? You say, it'll never do that. It's like kids, horses, and dogs. Right? Never say, it'll never do that. Wildlife will do what it chooses to do. So when you put an owl nest box up, I like four or five meters up. But like yeah. I say, you put it one meter off the ground, the owl's breaking it quite happily. And there they wanted a suitable nest site, and that was good for yeah. them. It's in an area where there's not a lot of pressure, so they yeah. can breed quite happily there. Oh, lovely. But, uh, let's have a look at some more uh, questions, some more comments here. You're a legend, says Meryl Levington. Uh, uh, she's Meryl, the, yeah. the, uh, and, oh, me too, she says. You're also a legend then, uh, Meryl. <laughs> I think that was something else. Wendy says, we must catch the rat like Gino did in a cage. Yes, yeah. and then we'll bring it for these raptors to eat. That's right. I think uh, uh, somebody says they can use ducks. Uh, Josh Klein says, facts. Um, uh, Natalie, Natalie New says they can use ducks to catch snails. Can they do that? Yes, of course. Yes. Yeah, they've been ducks. doing that for a long time. Yes, ducks are very good. Ducks are very good. Proper. And on some of the poultry will catch snails. Some chickens and that will also sort snails out. Ah, chickens as well. So, so you can have a, a chicken or two. But then the problem, we've had chickens here, but then the genets get the chickens. I like the way you think, says Socrates. Uh, and then, um, let's see, watching from New Zealand. Thank you, Chris. Lovely. We, we've uh, Actually, somebody better, better tag old uh, Ronald Minar. He's going to miss out because <laughs> he, normally, he normally watches from New Zealand as well. Um, Kathy Newman says, uh, did your interest in wildlife start at junior school? Uh, did you have a mentor? Okay. So here's the interesting fact. This yeah. is the harsh fact of life. Yeah. You see, my parents told me, and it's urban legend, mm. right? The same parents that I believe COVID would get rid of, but didn't work on them. <laughs> but they said to me that I was just 
under four years of age and they took me to Joburg Zoo. Yeah. And when the time came to leave the zoo, I hang on the, hung on the bars and I refused <laughs> to leave and said, told them to go home. So it started a lot uh, longer. So, yeah. It should be nicer I, to I, them if that's the case, Arnold. <laughs> I can't imagine that you'd be the easiest child to, to Well, I'll be honest with raise. you. By the time I was, I think I was about nine years old, my mother never came into my room at all because I had a puff at her that was pregnant Jeez, like. in the, my bedside cabinet. And she didn't know about it. And she opened it and had the babies and this whole batch of puff her babies fell out onto the floor so she stopped <laughs> immediately never came to my room again i split the half of my room and i, I put up a mesh and i had um worm slungs and all kinds oh, of things geez. by the time i was 10 or 12 that didn't i used to spend my, what did i do after school yeah. i'd run those old army rucksacks on my back <laughs> bottles snakes scorpions frogs spiders holy moly Mount Pleasant Flay, that was my hunting ground. Oh, really? that's, why I, that's how I knew when they came up. I don't know if you saw the little Barney I had about Mount Pleasant Flay. They said, oh, oh no, no, this no. is not a wetland. This is just oh, a no. borrow pit. Oh, right. And uh, they got horribly sorted out of that one. And they had okay. to stop all of that digging of illegal digging oh, of that yeah. wetland. Okay, okay. Yes, well, that was my stomping ground. So that's oh, where right. I grew up collecting all of those things. So wow. from a kid and my grandparents' farm. So, you know, I was always on the farm. I used, when where I got were you born? Where you, P, P, P born, okay. So when I got to the farm, the first thing I do is disappear and they never see me the whole day. And then late at night, it come back muddy, dirty, clutching some newfound thing. What books did I read? Gerald Durrell. Always oh, loved wow. Gerald Durrell, Gerald David Darryl. Attenborough, those people. <laughs> Darryl, yeah. So, you know, you go into all of that stuff and then you look at the, 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 the big picture. Yeah. And again, I go back to the thing. People have a lot of a lot to say about zoos and that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the future of a lot of wildlife lies in very good zoos. Do you know how many zoos or breeding species that are extinct in the wild are virtually extinct and yeah. reintroducing them? And Gerald Durrell, who was my big hero, he's yeah. long dead, but his zoo, Jersey Zoo, is one of the most famous zoos in the world for reintroduction of species that were extinct, especially yeah. in Madagascar. Yeah. So, you know, you sit and you, you look at all of the crap and you've got to sort through the crap and decide for yourself yeah. and come up with things. But, you know, it's like saying all zoos are bad. It's bullshit. There are a lot of zoos that are doing amazing work. And, you know, one of the things I feel very strongly about. So, mm. here I go, find a damaged turtle. Mm. Who do I take it to? I take it to Baywall. They have the most amazing people there to look after yeah. these turtles. And most amazing. I saw you found a, it, was, it was an invasive turtle, but I mean, you don't want to oh, kill yeah, it yeah, as yeah. well. Uh, uh, yeah, the, no, the that's so, a, yeah, so that's that a, well. a red head slider. Uh, yeah, that's, that's the one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. This, it, so that so was an interesting one. Eh? That yeah. teaches you be careful because if yeah. phone, oh, no, I've got a turtle in my garden. I nearly said, listen, go and chuck it in the nearest dam. And something said to me, What's up me a photo? Yeah. And I saw, oh, ready at slider. Yeah. Bad news. So Australian, is this? No, North American. Oh, North American, okay, wow. But, I mean, Baywall does the most amazing work. There's Sherry who looks after the yeah. um, uh, the Se seals and seals all of that stuff. You know, and then you have Sankop. You have all yeah, these people Sankop. doing amazing work. And then you watch our organization like Baywall get slighted. They mm. do the most amazing work under the most difficult conditions. They really have difficult working conditions, but they do their best. Could, could they not, I mean, could it not be, because, because I mean, nobody really wants to see an animal that's caged and sitting in a little spot, you know, so is there not a, not a way that you could, if they could be rehabilitated, rehabilitated there, people could see them while they're rehabilitated and then, and then out to the Well, all of those wilds. things get released. What do you think? They hang on to everything. Yeah, it all right. gets fixed oh, and released. released. Okay. Like I do, you know? Yeah, yeah. Fixed and released, fixed and released. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and that is always the thing for me. That is why I feel very strongly about one-sided sentiments on any topic. Mm -hmm. You know, those emotive, oh, this is all bad. and that. Yeah. You've got to look... It's a spectrum, I suppose. At a broad yeah. spectrum. You've yeah. got to keep yeah. your horizon. And you've got to understand yeah. that the world is a very, very complicated place. Yeah, yeah. And the management of wildlife is a very complicated issue. Yeah. You know, and I can understand. You know, I'll give you a classic example. So, I get a phone call from a woman. Yeah. Uh, oh, oh, I better tell you, I've got a warmer story for you. I'll tell you this warmer story. And this is why we know that, that wildlife is on a downward trend. But let me tell okay, you yeah, the yeah. first, the real story. Yeah, yeah. Something caught a, my cat. Oh, Something God. caught my cat. Yeah. Okay. Where did it happen? In my house. What? Oh, Jesus. <laughs> In your house. Yes, no, okay. You won't believe it. Crown eagle. Through the house. Caught three of her cats inside the house. Holy 
off the table, out the window. Is that, in, is that here in Walmart? Yeah. No, no, not in Walmart. Okay, the Walmart say. story is even better. Okay. So now, okay. of course, <laughs> I'm really revved up on this crowned eagle story because okay. this is pretty cool stuff. I mean, you know, you've got to be a really sneaky eagle you. to come zip through a house, nice. grab a cat and zip out the other side. <laughs> and funny, the first crowned eagle I saw as a kid was sitting in a tree. And you know, crowned eagles are stealth hunters, so they sit dead still. Okay. And I heard a cat going, meow, meow, yeah. meow. And I looked around, where's this cat? Where's this cat? And then I looked up, and I'll never forget, there was a young crowned eagle sitting probably the height of this roof. It was a yellow tree yeah. above me, and he had this big ginger tom in his talons, like, oh, and he was just sitting dead money. still. So the crowned eagles, yeah, I think, got shot, actually. Oh, wow. The in fact, I did, yeah. Yeah, I did, yeah, they it's got shot some time ago by somebody. Man. Which is very sad. But crown eagles in suburbia will take a lot of small dogs and cats yeah. and that. So some pet owner, no doubt, no lost it with ways. it. So now comes the best story. This is why, and this is from your suburb, so you should appreciate yes, it. Yes. I get a phone call. Now, this is just after this crown eagle went through the house, yeah, yeah. grabbed Kitty out the other side, did it three times, eh? Yeah, three yeah. cats, Jeez, Grim Reaper. Three cats. So I get, a, I get a phone call from your suburb up here. Yeah. Listen. This house should be on top billing. I've never seen a house as <laughs> magnificent as this. You know, I felt like a peasant getting to the <laughs> gate. Right? You know, there's almost like a butler to greet you. Yes, anyway, yes. the story is that a large eagle had come into the house, right? Attacked them. Okay. And they'd had to get out of the way. So, of course, they crowned <laughs> eagles in the valley at that time. So I'm thinking, ah, oh, juvenile crown. This yeah. is now, this is now the real stuff. Yeah, yeah. You know, I'm pretty chuffed now, yeah, juvenile yeah, yeah, crown, yeah, trying yeah. to take a kid. Yes. One less human, <laughs> blah, 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 blah. It's interesting record. By the way, crowned eagles have got quite a nasty record of that. Really? Yes. Take in the you. forests of Zaire. Uh, Zaire? Yeah, really. You know, you get yeah, the pygmies that do the forest, the slash and burn. Yes. What do they do? Take the baby off the back, put it in the shade of a tree, small baby like it. Adult female crowned eagle will take on a three-quarters grown bushbuck ram. I actually yeah. watched one one day. Listen, it broke a road down the side of a cliff, literally knocking everything over, rolling with a bushbuck ram. Oh, so they yeah, mean yeah. predators, and the youngsters are quite aggressive. They're not yeah, yeah. shy to take. I had one that I trained, a male, yeah. and uh, eventually I released him back into the wild because he just he wanted to take my dogs all the time. Yeah. As you got, as you got, yeah, yeah. You know, Mr. Yeah. Big Boy, then he thought, no, I like these dogs. I might have a dog flapper. Anyway, point of the matter, so now we come to the house that is the mansion and beyond mansions to yes. save these people from this vicious eagle. Yes. Right. Now, please, folks, I mean, there was a color TV probably bigger than your window on the wall. <laughs> you know, all of the, you can imagine the scene, uh, all of the yeah. decor and stuff. So in I go, I march in. Here's this lady, she's got two kids hiding behind her. Yes. Terrified. Yes. It's a shame, you know, these kids have been through real trauma. The crown <laughs> eagle's pretty mean, you know. Yeah, yeah. You've seen those set of talons that big, yeah, you know. Yeah. Chasing the kids around the house. Anyway, going to the kitchen. Where is this vicious bird of prey? Right, no sign of it. So, where's this bird? No, they think it's gone into the pantry. Oh, going geez. to the pantry. I kid you not. There was a baby Nasnaluri. A pitch back <laughs> baby <laughs> Nasnaluri. And you know what Nasnalurys do when they're scared? They jump in the air and they bite you right there. <laughs> Did well, that. you know, I looked at it and I came out with it under my... In fact, that nice and had its own story. But I came with it out under my arm and I thought, you know, this is why the world's screwed. <laughs> this is why the world's screwed, people. Do this they, is where we they, go. They can't fly very far. So do, do no, they... it was a baby. It couldn't even fly. It was still a downy. Oh, didn't even have proper feathers. Just a little black puff going... Ch -ch -ch -ch, trying to bite <laughs> everyone around. to protect itself. And, and do, is, that, is that true that, that, that they can't... That they... Um, they have to go down, 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 or they don't go. To, they don't go very far. They live in the valleys or in the, in the valley because they, because they can't fly very far. They have to be at a higher level to go to the next level. How do they, how do they move around? You know, mm. it's that story is very similar to the story of the Fakawi bird. You know the story of the Fakawi bird. <laughs> oh, there we go. Where'd you come on that one? Those things glide pretty well. Yeah, you know? they do. I've seen them glide nicely, but I mean, don't they have to be higher than they were before? So they need to have tall trees. Or no, something? no. I can tell you how how I gained my. Yes. <laughs> Listen, I can. <laughs> I was told that. I won't even bring up who told me that. <laughs> no, I'd rather let's leave that one out of the thing. Right. So I've raised more than the odd lies and luri, and they're highly entertaining. So. Yeah, yeah. I let one go out of my garden because I, I would like to see it come back every now and then and say hello and how things and etc etc. Now this one 
it was destined for death. I've never <laughs> in my life seen such a dumb bird. Okay. You know, because you what it could do. Now, my whole area there has raptors second to none. And a nice little lure is hardly a speed of creation. Right? Yeah, so it come gliding from a big blue gun across an open field, like 300 meters of open field, where every peregrine falcon that's sitting on a pile on watching just okay. sees a slack coming underneath to come so and like to me. And eventually I was too scared that the lurie would see I was in the garden, because if he was over there, he'd just come gliding, and I would uh, go, oh, 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 where's the peregrine now? Where's the peregrine yeah, now? Right. Anyway, so he survived, and then he disappeared. And I thought, okay, well, you've got to eat him, boy. Your, your a year later, I go to a guy in Ben Karma. He's got a poison owl in his garden. He says, you know, pick up the owl, owl's poison, okay, et cetera, et cetera. He says, you know, before you go, I want to ask you something. He says, I've got a nice little lurie that visits you, and it's got a ring on it. I said, oh, is oh, it? No way. And he says, you know, he says, it loves my granddaughter, and she goes outside, and she calls and waves a banana, and it comes to you. <laughs> That's after a year, that bug was still bumming <laughs> off people. <laughs> So I've got a soft spot for Nazi Luris. Yeah, they no, no, no. they are quite entertaining characters and, in their own right. And, and indigenous um, uh, uh, birds and animals. Um, I mean, like you say, it's more like a feral thing. Where or, or, or uh, how do you distinguish? Um, like, like the Egyptian geese, for, ex for instance, are, are they indigenous as well, or they ju just too many of them, or is it that they are they um, they're coming in from elsewhere? Okay, so with Egyptian geese, they're indigenous, but they're very invasive. Okay, okay. So. They just get on yeah, too yeah, well with you. What should one do when a just just keep coming to one's pool? Keep chasing Who's, them we away. We won't say it's your pool then, Wendy. Keep chasing them away. Chase them away. <laughs> She's, Wendy will never chase them away. <laughs> no, you've got to keep chasing them. That's the problem because when they settle, you will regret that day because your pool will be a green mess. Oh, yeah. No, very, very bad. I think so, she, she might just she'll be okay with the green pool. <laughs> no, listen, I'm not. You know, the problem with Egyptian geese for me, the big problem has been the last couple of years is the pure fact that owls are threatening enough in the urban environment. Mm. The last thing they need is, and they take even the because the owls choose a nest site that's very similar to what geese like. Yeah. Let me go to an amazing story about Egyptian geese. Yeah. So, I've got two raptor nest boxes up on the Sasko silos. Now, those yes. silos are high. You know, the ones next. No, down there. Uh, Next to the freeway, there the we freeway. go, to Swart Corp, so okay, big silos, okay, okay. right? The one nest box is bred in by peregrine falcons. The other side one, every year the Egyptians come and breed. Yeah. So one day I'm going to check on the peregrines, yeah. right? And I watch the most amazing sight. So the mother flies across, she goes and sits on the other side silo, yeah. and she calls. And like little parabats, they just jump out. One yeah. after the other. They fall the whole length of the silo, land on the concrete and just walk away. <laughs> like little tumbles. They go all the way to the ground. They just all walk away. Yes. I watched it. It was absolutely magnificent to watch. Now, what is very interesting, in America, they had the Carolina wood ducks. And Carolina That's... wood ducks were on the verge of extinction. So they needed to breed them in captivity. Okay. But they weren't capable of getting the chicks to feed. Yeah. And then one clever boy, he found out they need to fall to stimulate feeding. I don't know. So Egyptian geese... The babies definitely need that tumble they because they often breed high up in trees and you'll find the babies on the ground following the yes. mother. They need that tumble to get them going. The problem is, like I said, they like a lot of the good nest sites that owls choose in the hollows and that, and they're just way, way too aggressive. Yeah, and think. you know, it was fine when there was a pair in each river, but mm -hmm. now there's 500 in each river. Yeah, yeah. And of course, they like swimming pools and people feel sorry. The next yes. thing is 12 babies in the pool they're and they're feeding them yeah, every day. Yeah. They're cute yeah. in that, and that's yeah. when the menace starts. Yeah. And of course, they carry a lot of bacteria in those feces and stuff, which get into your pool water. Not very good to be swimming around drinking it. Although, pee's water is pretty yeah, much pretty the same. Cramp anyway. No, just drink your pool water. It's probably better than, <laughs> better than water out the taps. Out the taps yeah. So, just drink it Holy like that. Well, I know that, that uh, Garth Sampson's been, the, been the, the, the grim reaper for us. He's telling us that, that the water's running out very, very quickly. We've got to, we've got to make, a, make some sort of plan. Candice there saying, Candice Rose saying, very interesting to watch Arnold Slump. Well done, she says. Uh, what about cattle in urban areas? My dog and I were chased by a large bull. You know, it is a very, very interesting concept that. Mm. Because the municipality is actually responsible. And if you're injured or maimed or killed or anything. Let me just sure. get on to the rabies thing. The rabies yeah. thing on its own is very yeah. interesting. So we sit with a, the worst rabies outbreak ever. There's no doubt in that. It is the worst ever. Now, a lot at of it... At the moment. At the yeah, moment, sure. right. A lot of it has been kept very quiet. Mm. And I'm sure there are good reasons for it. You know, the municipality is responsible for rabies surveillance. So okay, yeah. let's see how much rabies surveillance the municipality... Because what actually happens, if you do your surveillance properly, now you pick up rabies in X 
then you immediately start a real vaccination program, yeah. you get rid of the feral dogs, etc., etc. Okay. But this didn't happen. So rabies is now spread. There's not a sub in PE where there's not rabies. Right. Yeah. More importantly, if you look at the whole of the states, right? The yeah. states, big place, yeah, million yeah. people or what? Yeah. Don't guess how many people die from rabies in the states in a year. What do you think? It, it can't be too many. I, I mean, I'd have to say like a thousand. Or, two I'm people guessing. a year. How many people have died from rabies in PE, one little city in the past two or three months? Two. <laughs> Is About it? 14, really? mostly children. The last case was in Utenag this weekend. Really? We so have, it's still going, eh? We have, because we had, it was in the paper course. when it started. Uh, with, uh, no, two of cases course it's still paper. going. Now the problem we're sitting with is this. So people like myself are in the field the whole time. You can actually pick it up. Okay. Like in the Kucha area and that, you can see the dead animals lying there in the riverbeds and stuff. And you can see... The wild animals die as well. Yes, of course. Rabies. Everything. You know, there are a lot of different species. In fact, all mammals can get rabies. Even horses and cattle can get rabies. Okay. So you see all of these animals lying there. Mo yellow mongoose, cat greys, all of them just lying dead. Mm -hmm. What happens when a wild animal is sick? Normally, goes into a nice, quick, quiet, thick, dark place and dies. With rabies, it's different. It loses that... Mental capacity to think I need to get into. So they'll just die out in the open. And dogs in that too. They, you just find them dead or dying in the open. Yeah. So we sit with all of that. And that is the direct result of people not doing their work properly. Yeah. Because it is very interesting. So when we had a very bad rabies outbreak in the city many years ago. I'm yeah. talking about the early 19th century. Yeah, yeah. And the only way it was controlled was every single dog found wandering was killed. Yes, yes. Every I, single I dog found that. wandering around or over was killed. I read about right. that. Uh, in, in PE, it was... Yes. Yeah, yeah, just uh, early 1900s. I, uh, I, exactly. I that history thing. But that, so what effectively happened is it was the only way to start bringing control to what is happening. Yeah. Right. So you now sit with a problem. You sit with these cattle all over the place. If someone gets injured by one of those cattle, mm. right, technically speaking, the municipality, who we pay our rates and taxes to, is the responsible person. They are responsible. There's a lot of legal factors, right, that people do not even consider. And the municipality doesn't consider it because they've got away with it for years. That pollution of the river is another legal factor. You know, they've got away with that little case, a little bit of yeah. threatening, and they're getting away with it. It's the same with all of this stuff. If you get killed or injured by domestic stock, yeah. the municipality is responsible for preventing domestic stock they should not be farming in the middle of town yeah i find it kind of cute to love seeing those cattle wandering yeah. around yeah. but they listen <laughs> you can get killed <laughs> yeah. a lot of those cattle are pretty wild and if they got a car for that and you walk past with a the dog they'll go for you in five Ooh. seconds you know? <laughs> so they can be dangerous very what about, dangerous what about the dussies how do you control the spread because the dussies are quite uh, it depends on what area i think okay so a lot around very, very interesting thing because you're now bringing me to a point which is close to my heart. Yeah. I've done my best over the years to encourage people to a large degree to try and live with wildlife. Mongooses, for example, yeah. are one of the species. Yes. You know, mongooses catch a lot of snakes. They catch rats. Yeah. They catch, they're nice to have around. They catch Egyptian geese because we they had catch, one. They, they, catch, they catch a lot yeah. of gods. They, they're a natural form of control. Yeah. My problem now is rabies because rabies is in dusties as well. Oh, yes, okay. unfortunately. So now with a clear conscience, I can't go to people and say, oh, just ignore that mongoose, it's fine, it's not going to attack yeah, yeah. because of the rabies situation. And we are getting rabies and dussies. Yeah. Not even debatable. Yeah, okay. So, yeah. yeah. In fact, so someone was bitten by a rabid dussies in the northern area. And, and is dussie also, um, it's, it's not invasive, it's, it's actually a... In a, some areas, dussies can be a real problem. Yeah, yeah. You see... But they're not from a different country, not from a different area. They're not brought in. No, no, no. Uh, this is indigenous right, to the yeah, area. Indigenous but itself. your problem with your dices is they no problem if there's a lot of natural predators. Okay. Yeah. But immediately the natural predators are less. Mm. They can forage further. Old story. The more food you get, the more you breed, mm. et cetera, et cetera. So very much like vervet monkeys. So if you look at vervet monkeys and dices, they're very yeah. much in the okay. same circumstance. Okay, yes. The main predator on dices in the summer month is actually lynx. Oh. Believe it or not, before all of this crap and poaching started, I actually reintroduced a fair amount of African lynx, yeah. caracal, yeah. back into the valley again. Wow. Into, okay, yeah. it's, uh, further, because, further up, obviously. Uh, no, but because they are very, very... In fact, the majority of a lynx's diet 
I must be careful using that word links. Yeah. It's not really. It's caracal, but caracal. I come from okay. the old days as an African lynx. Okay. Anyway, the That's majority the things of the, that the farmers always want to shoot, isn't it? Yeah, the majority caracal. of a lynx's diet is dusty. It's in a very well managed area. The summer diet is mainly dusty. Okay. So I introduced dusties into the valley, but unfortunately all the poaching and the hunting and that, you know, they, it's just not possible for these caracal to survive that long without, because they get chased by the dogs and that continuously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So without that predation, without mm -hmm. crowned eagles hunting the dusties and that, they're able to forage right out into the open. So they have an unlimited food supply and gardens are very good food supply. Yes. And they can just like do everything else, just breed and breed and yeah. breed. So if you go to vervet monkeys, for example, if you go to a natural area, a troop of vervet monkeys is eight, ten animals. Okay. If you come round town, round marine drive, you can find anywhere from 30 to 70 animals in a troop. Yes. Right. Exactly. Why? Yeah. Easy food. Yeah. Right. Lack of natural predation. Main predator on monkeys, crowned eagle. Really? Crown eagle is a ma if a monkey can't wander out into the open if their crown eagles around yeah, and they're yeah. terrified of crown eagles. What happens? Limits the food availability, they don't breed as much. Yeah. Crown eagles catch a lot of monkeys, leopards help, and so do African rock python. Okay. So leopards we yeah. still have it's in our general it. area. Yeah. African rock python, the Gramson area, they originally would have occurred down here, yeah. but Gramson area, the African rocks. Yeah. Uh, leopards and crown eagles, of course, won't occur in town. Yeah, yeah. But lynx, I must need to get. Yeah, well. I'm an old man. Caracal. <laughs> yes. Caracal. Yeah. Caracal are very, very efficient predators of okay. dust. It's very, very easy. good predators on them. But because you've got no predation and you've got lots of food, they will just population yeah. will grow and grow and grow. And unfortunately, like I say, rabies is non dusty. So. Because I mean, I, 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 with, with the farmers, I always wanted to shoot it out there, but surely. Maybe we should. You could, are they dangerous to humans? Can no, no. That's they, why they I introduced them quietly. Yeah, and just a couple of adult caracal in really, yeah. yeah, particularly no, from fantastic. farming areas where they regard as the best. Okay. And they do. They settle down quite well. And there's a lot of food for them. Yeah. But the yeah. problem is, you know, it's a sad, vicious cycle. Yeah. If we don't control the poaching in the valley, if yeah. we don't control, because rem dumping and poaching and dumping, is, dumping poaching. Is, it's also it, it, I mean, um, destruction. Is, is dumping here a small little. Uh, 20 bags that they keep on bringing every year, clean it up and then they bring it back again. But the, the animals are there. They, that's an easy, easy food, isn't it? I mean, that's the problem. The, you know, the, the sad thing is, is that everything has to be managed. And if there's no management in place, mm. it just goes to, you know what. And the problem with our valley is that there is no management in mm. place. There is nobody. The people that are supposed to look after the valley don't give a damn. Let's be honest about that. They actually don't give a damn. You know, and then you've got this continuous sewerage problem, yeah. but the the valley could actually be a wildlife paradise if we are prepared to put the effort in. It could, yeah. you know, what actually it was the most amazing sight, and I won't forget it. For the yeah. first time in thirty years, I saw some wild mountain reed back on the edge of PE. Really. And those are proper yeah, wild. Big. They used to be there. Now every now and then I've been called to catch mountain reed back in the middle of town. Yeah. And yeah, I was this little herd the other day of mountain reed back. And I said okay. to myself, you know, this is absolutely amazing. You know, just that little glimmer of hope again. Mm. But the problem is it's going to take very, very proactive management yeah. of the whole area. And the yeah. municipality, the way it looks, there is nothing proactive about them. Yeah. They're not even reactive. They're just yeah, inactive. Yeah. 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 You know, and that is the problem facing us because yeah. the valley needs to be managed properly. Yeah. And if we can get the decent management into the valley, it can be an amazing place. The private sector is going to have to, we're going to have to get uh, private uh, private sector in. That's the, isn't that the, isn't that the only way to do it at the moment? Where we, we can try and assist and and uh, and at least if municipality can do something, we can add to it. You know, I think everybody's got to get involved. You always got to think about it. If everybody. There's a big population here in PE. If everybody thinks about it and everybody tries to do something, it, it becomes a small task for everybody and it, and, it, and, it, and it grows. I mean, is that is that the case? Or, it, or it's about will. So you said to me, what is the first thing that we need to, to do here? Yeah. We've got to start controlling the illegal hunting. Okay. And it's been a very difficult task. It's been a difficult task because, again, we're sitting with all of these do-gooders yeah. that feel sorry for the dogs. And is, the, is it a gambling, a gambling thing, isn't it? Uh, no, no, no. It's, not, not, it's not that kind of thing. What has happened is that during COVID, because everything went quiet, yeah. these guys got into a rut of just coming through warmer into the valley and poaching. Or they yeah. poached right through the day, right into the night. They just poached up and yeah, down. Yeah. So they got into that rut. Mm. Right? I had a run-in with them about two years ago, and we managed to get 16 dogs. 
which we took to uh, the Utenag SPCA and the like Kevin Brown okay. euthanized them all. Yeah. And what was very interesting is all of those dogs were vaccinated, inoculated and spayed. So they're all dogs that have been done by animal welfare agencies, yeah. which are now healthy and in good health, etc. Yeah, and have yeah. even been fed by them, which yeah. have been used for the hunting. Yeah. So, you know, and Kevin actually said to me, you see, these are all these animal welfare agencies yeah, dogs. Yeah, yeah. The problem is, is that the municipality has to do something about the dogs. Yeah. The dogs are the great, they, at the moment, dogs and sewerage are the greatest threat to the valley yeah. because it is uncontrolled and you will have very little wildlife if you've got people literally daily coming through with big packs of dogs. Mm -hmm. There's no ways. Yeah. You can't have wildlife. You know, you the odd bag, things will survive. Tortoises. I mean, yeah. you really don't see tortoises around the, anymore. The odd know? things will survive. You'll have a couple of dassies because they live in the crowns. Mm -hmm. It's a lot more difficult to get at. But all of your game species, your small mammals, your caracal, your genets and stuff ultimately get killed by those dogs. And it used to be um, little monitors here, little. Uh, what do you oh, listen, I've seen them go out carrying monitors on their yeah. backs. They kill them as really, well. Really? Yes, very Jeez. sought after. Oh, man, unbelievable. Um, what, what do the, the, the local extinct species is, is okay. there anything that's gone right so let you let me let me go through all of the stuff right so first of all you're looking at grass owl yeah grass owl yeah marsh owl mm -hmm. right yeah. secretary bird wow marshall eagle yeah well, i have to go through them carefully them okay yeah. um Common reed buck. Yeah. Right. So I'm, I'm looking at the species over the last 40, 50 years that yeah, originally yeah, occurred yeah. in this area. Okay. You would have had Oribi here as well within the city. They occurred up to Mossel Bay in 1960. So by the 70s, they were been wiped out in the Bethelsdorf and Stardens area. Okay. Right. Okay. Um, Red-breasted sparrowhawk or rufous-breasted sparrow. Again, you know, yeah, the name changed all the time. Rufous-breasted sparrowhawks are gone. Okay, um, I'm just going through all of the stuff in the back of my mind. There's one or two other species. I think I've said Marshall, eh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Marshall's Marshall are gone. Well, yeah. Now, yeah. interestingly enough, and this you could take other way. So, I would get at least two or three Marshall air eagles uh, in from the greater PE area every single year for rehabilitation. Yeah. They're either connected with power lines, young birds, etc., etc. Now I might get one every 10 years. Wow. That's how bad the situation is. Secretary birds, I'll get three, four a year. From Unfortunately, yeah. you know what's happened to secretary birds? Yeah. Secretary birds are now critically endangered. But Jeez. the problem is, so they breed... The white ones. The, 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 big, the big guys that eat the snakes. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. So they breed in a nice solitary little tree, thorn tree, normal acacia sticking out. They have their nest on top. Yes. What happens... The juvenile leaves the nest, now he's wandering around, he can't fly, yeah. gets killed by dogs. Oh man. Okay. Because of all the dogs. So I had one, two, two active nests and one other site. Those birds are all gone because the dogs, there's just too many dogs. They can't yeah. raise a single chick there. Jeez. You know, so those sites are gone. Um, yeah, so it's, a, it's, a, it's very interesting watching these species disappear. Yeah. You know, grass owls, we find them egg on the, you know, St. Albans okay. at the closest to P. But originally we had grass owls in Cotswold. We had yeah. them in Heatherbank. All those places, yeah. they're all gone. One of the things is what do grass owls do? They breed on the ground. Mm -hmm. Nothing mm -hmm. that breeds on the ground can survive. Marsh yeah. owls the same. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Uh, it's Bugsy, Bugs, Bugsy Phoenix saying, how's it? Watching from England. Great watch. Thank you, Bugsy. And Donnell Goldberg, you see, I've looked at a couple of these things as well, catch up a little bit. Do, do you know, I was also a history enthusiast. Oh, I didn't know that. Do you enjoy about history? Yeah. So I, I, like, love, I like history. I love it. I love I like it. History. You know what I've done? I think you need to do it as well. Yeah, yeah. I've done something, and I think this is the most amazing thing. Yeah. I'm going to have my DNA sent away and tested to see where exactly I come from. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't know. I, I, I haven't. Uh, I mean, I know I'm half Italian. Half of my uh, DNA is Italian, of course. You guys are so cool. Thank well, you, Bugsy. And, uh, and, and Lynn Potiphar is saying, uh, amazing drawing, so interesting. It, it is. Uh, Tertia de Toy, love this conversation. Thank you. Excellent. Oh, she did chase the geese, says, says uh, Wendy. We good. have three owls that come to the complex. That's down at uh, Summer Strand Way, so that's great. 
Uh, we've got so many awesome stories. Please, can you do a weekly chat on here? <laughs> no. We do it twice a week. We do it twice a week. Can we vaccinate our animals? Uh, where can we vac vaccinate our animals free of charge? Saying uh, Philippa. Um, is there a birthplace? Yeah, a lot, the state vet normally does, but I think okay. you must just find the local veterinary practice. They do have okay. days for vac rabies vaccination. Oh, the rabies. rabies and state. you know, the frightening thing is, I was talking to my good friend, Dr. Matt. Uh, yeah. You can't believe it. People in the fanciest suburbs in town. Yeah. Oh, my dog's not vaccinated against rabies. Yeah. No, Jeez, I just can't it. believe it. No, Seriously. Do it, eh? Seriously. Yeah. Do you know yeah. how many people are rocking up at the vet's practice? I mean, the, yeah. the most frightening story I heard was a guy from Bridgemead. Yeah. It's a sausage dog. Yeah. Good old Dachshund. Yeah. In his garden, never gets out. The dog started behaving funny, blah, yeah. blah, blah. Takes him to the vet. Rabies. Oh, so, you know, rabies positive, actually tested rabies positive, but yeah. why did the guy not have his dog vaccinated? Yeah. Did he think because it's in the back garden, it's impossible? So it's important to do it, guys. I think no, the rabies good. is the most frightening thing. Yeah. COVID, yes. you can forget about that joke, but rabies, watch out. Queenie's, Queenie, <laughs> Queenie, Queenie, Queenie's of course, for I'll, I'll go FM. Nice to see you on, Queenie. Mm. And uh, so amazing to watch Arnold. You're such a blessing and inspiration. I agree with Arnold. So much needs to be done by the municipality, but the correct people do not understand what it all entails. Yes, I think so. You know, you've got, we've got... Uh, Oh my word! Yeah, look, it's a, it's another whole, uh, um, um, a, uh, you know, a box of a, a, uh, what do you call it? A, a, a box that uh, full of Pandora's box. That's what I was looking for. Um, Lynn Boyd is saying, oh, "Wow, guys, so, so educational, very interesting. Thanks so much for music too. Love this show. Feel so enlightened. I'm glad. I do as well. I do as well. I was the one throwing a rat out into the valley. My God, I don't know how many birds it's killed since I put it out there. Probably half the valley. Since I made it. There's no bird life left here now. <laughs> Bugsy, do you guys have a problem with people getting lots of dogs during lockdown? Now they can't control them and in the." Uh, flushing loads of ground nesting birds out. I think bugs is in England and that will be yes, a big problem there sure. because you know all of a sudden exactly what if this is the, you know yeah. it just blows me away so now we have this whole lockdown thing yeah. so people are sitting at home take a guess one thing I think a lot of people realized how many birds the cats actually kill they weren't at home before now they're at home every day now they see our cat coming in with a sunbird yeah, and this and that you know. that is one thing the second thing is a lot of people then went out oh I want this dog and I like that dog and they google and they got all these dogs uh, what's going to happen to all of these dogs i just know yeah. people wait too well as soon as they're bored with the dog no, animal no. welfare yeah we come yeah, this, this dog's too naughty yeah it becomes very sad problem, story it becomes their problem you know what the saddest story i find people that immigrate and then hand their dog over to the domestic or something yeah. And, you know, it ends up in the township and, oh, yeah, you know, another story, yeah. horrible, horrible story. Camilla Ellis, said, what did she say? She said she went to Sacramento uh, dawn when money was threatened by a guy and his yeah. poaching dogs. Gee, was that? Eh? Well, my same friend, old Brandon, he lives in Sardinia Bay. Phone yeah. me, said that evening, three o'clock in the morning, they had rifle shots in the reserve. You know what was interesting? On the camera set up a warmer township, they caught yeah. the guys going out with the dogs, picked yeah. them up on camera and they were yeah. carrying rifles. Yo. They weren't just hunting with dogs anymore, they carry firearms. Yo and Brandon said early hours of the morning he worked to a rifle shot behind his house in the reserve. Holy crap. Uh, so Gary Joyce saying excellent chat, thanks man. And and um and I see uh, Andrew Stewart, great show. Also think on Arnold should be weekly. You're right, we should get we'll have to get updates. We're gonna have to get updates from you, Arnold. That's that's the I think that's the the yeah. secret here. Um, I mean, it's and, and incredible to think that um, that that these these animals are here. They are they are around. If you I mean, every now and again something pops up, you know, a little a little buck or a little and 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 nature is like that, isn't it? it, it does it? Does, how quickly does it come back, or does it? Does it not? Did you ever see that thing laugh after people? Uh, yes, yes, I had. I did. Uh, okay. a TV series. Eh? That yeah. is the most amazing thing. How? Potentially, nature can come back again, yeah. and just take over these cities and just chow them up. Have yeah. you watched the stuff on Chernobyl? <laughs> chow them up. Like yeah. Have you watched the stuff on Chernobyl? Chernobyl. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Have you seen how the wildlife come back? Yeah, it's just all come back, and it's it's a wildlife paradise. And a lot of these things are thinking, oh, these things should have radioactive, yeah. and they're there and they're doing their job. Now, glowing, glowing Putin and all his friends are oh, yeah, 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 yeah. clapping it out there. Yeah, so it's very sad. sad. But I mean, Chernobyl is an amazing story of wildlife just coming back under these circumstances. Yeah. So wildlife can recover. And if you said to me, you know, I always liked, I don't like thinking in the box, I think out of the box. You know what I would do in the Balkans? I'd put some black wildebeest in. Yeah. I'd put a couple of new species in. Yeah. Just add some species that originally occurred. And there's a reason for black wildebeest. Yeah. 
Black wildebeest or zebra don't take any nonsense from dogs. They'll yeah. sort the dogs out okay. in five seconds. Yeah, Anyone yeah. who knows black wildebeest yeah. will tell you. Okay. <laughs> okay. And they very well came close to occurring in the area. Zebra oh, do the same. They sort out dogs quite quickly. Okay. So yes. it would be really nice if someone ever had, you know, the gun. Yeah. You could, if you protected the Balkans properly, you could reintroduce a lot of indigenous species that occurred here, yeah, which yeah. should have, not have a negative impact on localization of the valley. Wonderful. When, but, you, when, when you're saying that the poachers as well uh, chased my neighbor's son while jogging near the airport. So, I mean, they're all over with these hunting dogs and things. But you know what the truth of the matter is? Let's go back to it. The real way to sort it out, yeah. it's a very harsh thing. The dogs have to be killed. Yeah. There's not even a debate that the dogs have to be killed. A lot of people have this whole thing about... Now, let me explain to you about killing things. Right. First of all, you need to have permission to use a firearm within the municipal area. Mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. Obviously, any form of firearm. Yes. So you need to have a permit to do that. And I have a whole series of permits from Nature Conservation to do various things. Mm -hmm. You need the landowner's permission as well. But the law plainly says that any dog found not in the control of its owner... In the pursuit of wildlife or presenting a threat to domestic stock may be destroyed. Okay. It doesn't say, yeah. you know, think about it, it can be destroyed. Yeah, yeah. Right. And people need to realize that because I had a very interesting conversation with people from the warmer area. And mm -hmm. I said, you know, you complain about the dogs, but yeah, you walk and you've got Fido running wild in the valley chasing mm -hmm. everything. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. what's good for the goose is good for the gander. You need yeah. to set the example. So if you're going to walk yeah. in those areas, keep your dog on a leash. On a leash, you have to do it. So keep your dog on a leash for the wildlife. Purely from a point of view, even if your dog is, that's because everybody says, my dog won't chase or whatever, you know, and, uh, you know, it's it's easy to think like that because it's your, your dog as well. So you know your dog, but the problem is that if you haven't got on a leash, then then w w w you, you're just doing this, you're breaking the same law. Isn't it? Well, the point of the matter, you're breaking the same law. And, the, the, you know, the valley is there for all to enjoy. Mm -hmm. It's not there for a select flu few to plunder. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I'm, like I said to you, I still am very ambivalent about public open space. Now, these guys yeah. like to hunt with their dogs. They can do it there. But mm -hmm. the valley is the line that should be drawn and said, so far, a protected no area. It's a protected area. Yeah. Leave it alone. Go and hunt in the public open space in the forest yeah. reserve at Drift Sand. Go and do your thing there. Yeah, yeah. But leave the valley alone. Yeah. That is a haven for the local wildlife. Absolutely. And, and if anything's, anything you see, if you spot anything, how can how, people that are watching now, how can they, if they spot anything happening, what, what can they do? What, how can they, who can do that? The, the police and the municipality are supposed to do something about poaching in the okay. valley. Okay. Okay. You know? They are the ones that are actually, the police will pass it on, but the municipality is responsible for managing the valley. They have got people that are paid to do the work, yeah, right? Yeah. They need to get off their asses and do their okay. job. That's, that's yeah. what it simply boils down to. Mm -hmm. And we need to find a way of controlling all of the dogs. Yeah, yeah. And if you do that, right, you, okay. you'll start to see the wildlife come back. Like I said, like that life after yeah. humans, you'll yeah, see yeah. a life after people. I can't remember what it's yes, called. Yes, it's just like amazing to watch how all the people, buildings yeah, collapse yeah. and the plants take over and you see all these animals wandering the streets. And, and now, I mean, if, for your stuff, I mean, it's always like, who do you call if, you, if, you, if, if something's gone wrong? Like uh, for snakes, you'll phone Mark Marshall, you know, he's, he's your snakes guy or whatever. But, but when, when would people have to phone you or get hold of you? Do you, well, do you do that stuff? I mean, is that what you... Uh, oh, people find me for virtually yeah. every wildlife thing. I'll give yeah. them advice. I'm not... Yeah. If You're you find me... You're not the go-to guy. <laughs> no, no, no. If you find me and you say I've got an issue and I'll, I'll think about it and I'll yeah, may yeah. give you a solution. Yes. Um, You're at least point in the right direction. If you find me and say, my cat brought in... A, my no, let me give you this one. Naughty. My naughty cat <laughs> brought in a bird. Yes. Right? I'm going to look at you and go, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. why don't you solve your own mess? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, you know? so you're but uh, invariably the birds come and have to euthanize them anyway, or they die a day or two later. You know, it's the whole yeah, story. Yeah. Um, but basically, I deal with all wildlife. I get calls, uh, the, yeah. particularly the birds of prey, the owls, and everything. I get hundreds of calls, yeah. sometimes, sometimes too many. And where can we bring our rats? <laughs> yeah, well, just caught in my send me a cage. WhatsApp. Well, I need, like, at the moment, it, the need is simmering because these 20 owls are going to go and then. Okay. Yeah, but All there right. comes a time when everything's <laughs> welcome. Every kind donation yes. from the gods, especially is in the summer months, you say. Yeah. Any 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 rats and and uh, mice and things that are that are and dussies and stuff that you could feed them. <laughs> yeah, I just love those people that say, "Oh, you've got a wonderful job." And ten o'clock at night, I'm sitting, I'm thinking, you know, I wonder all these assholes what they're doing. They're having a bra with a family, and here I am trying to feed a recalcitrant eagle or yes. drag some vicious beast out of a big hole in the ground, battling my life away. 
I must tell you this. So yes. I had a couple of really mean experiences, right? One of the saddest experiences was, oh, and I'll tell you one thing, the girl got roasted, but it was, oh dear. pisses me off the way people drive in town. Yeah. Right. Someone in Lorraine managed to ride over a honey badger. The oh. most magnificent female honey badger. Oh. Now, you should be doing 60 k's an hour yeah. or less. Yeah. You know, you would see that. Anyway, they killed it, son, did I? Oh, that still broke my heart. Oh, but I've had a number of really mean calls with honey badgers. And, oh. I mean, that deserved the reputation. Yeah. Because you will get honey badger, honey badger, honey badger, and honey badger will look at you and say, oh, thank you for saving me, off I'll go. And then you'll get one that will say, listen, I'm going to sort you out. I just don't like I what really you did with like me. You. Um, and you and I are going to have a little conversation <laughs> yeah. about this. So, so one night, I get, listen, far tougher than you. I oh, know how tough those buggers are. I've seen what they do to wire mesh and everything. And they are very destructive. So beekeepers hate them with a passion. And okay. yeah, they really knock those hives and make, chair big holes and destroy oh, hives. And they, but anyway, I love those creatures. They're among my favorite. Because basically, they've got a pugnacious attitude. And they walk around <laughs> permanently with a finger in the air to humanity and say, take that. <laughs> I get a call one night, CV Road. Yeah. Hot post eight at night. Quite a miserable night. Yeah. The guy says, you know, we've seen this animal. It's not by a car. It's black and white. Yeah. Okay. It's like those things you see on National Geographic. Yeah. Right? Skunk. <laughs> no, 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 no. No, I like those things. So when you talk about CV Road, there's a lot of big black and white bushbuck rams. Okay. Right. Yeah. So my first thought, oh, it's a bushbuck ram that's got to be off. So off I go to go and see what's wrong, see if it needs to be euthanized, whatever's got to be done. Yeah. I get there and I see the people, they said they'll wait for me and I see they're standing on the back of the bucky yeah. and they're peering over the road. Now it's pitch dark, <laughs> right? So I stop, I get, I say, where is this animal? And they point like that over the road from safe distance. And with that, I hear this kind of low, angry growl coming out of Port right. Jackson next to the road. <laughs> Needless to say, I go to the back of the buckies and grab a net quickly, yeah. grab a, a net that I feel is suitable for the job. Yeah. I come around the front of the back, bucky and this rattle comes out the bush. He chases me for 100 meters down <laughs> CV Road, but right on my heel, rattle. snapping. Now, what, is this? what is this thing? It's honey like, badger. Is it, is it, is it it's also a rattle. Rattle. Yeah. Okay, okay. So he chases me down CV Road, right? <laughs> In the pitch dark, I'm running with a rattle on my heel. Eventually... He tires, I tire, he goes off into the bush, right? And he's still mumbling and growling and that, and he walks off. I've actually got a video of a rattle, and you can actually see the teeth behind my heels is chasing me after I release it. But not all of them, some of them after go off. It. You just got to get the right one. You know, it's that right, right one that yeah. says, listen, I've had a bad day, and you've no, just made it worse. Screw now. you, man. You <laughs> then, next to my rattle story is a story that fortunately I have an eyewitness who was sitting next to me, yeah. right right next to me. We're driving down Chelsea Road, just on dusk. Yeah. Hey, there's a guy on a bicycle. He's taking his dog with him for a run. What an idiot. Why is he running with his dog? Dog running behind him. I look and I go, jeez, it's a rattle. And he has this rattle and this guy's pumping like hell and this rattle's right <laughs> behind him on the bicycle. So, yeah, rattles okay, are quite, can be actually, there's, there's a fair amount of them in the area, actually. And they are... Top species, threatened okay. species. So okay. I like well, them. Uh, how do they? Are they? Are they they're bigger than genets and and more Yeah, than no, so. they're they fair sized creatures. Uh, how Look big, like how a big, big skunk. Okay, big skunk. Okay, because and I, they're pretty smelly too because they're muscled, so they smell quite. Really, really. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, uh, last couple of questions I've got. Otherwise, we'll be here all night. I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to get you on again for sure. Absolutely, uh, Pamela Beer. Thank you. Good laugh. Most entertaining. Arnold. Thank you, man. And um, we. Uh, Always, last couple of questions, always your most embarrassing moment or, or your uh, most moment when something's gone completely wrong mm. and, and then your proudest moment. Hmm. I know it's a tough one to just quick, quickly spring on you at the end. <laughs> okay, it was not embarrassing, but it was quite funny. Yeah. It happened okay. during my conservation career. Yes, yes. So I get called to the Holy Rosie Convent. Oh, yes. Now, yes, there's a big... It's Philippa's school. That's yeah. where my wife runs her school from now. Okay. There's a big male baboon, and he's been terrorizing the city for days. Holy moly. Right. Okay. So, he's in the school grounds. Okay. Right. So, my boss's instructions are, Arnold, he's got to go. Shoot it. Yeah, he's okay. a danger. He's got to go. Go and do your job. Yeah. So, I get to the convent now. You know, all those nuns, mothers, yes. parents, oh, they phone me. Oh, yes, yes, yes. 
Ja. Bless you, my son. Bless you, my son, etc. That kind of stuff. Name the father of the Holy Spirit. So, <laughs> now, the whole thing is, right, that I need... Oh, wait, I've got an even greater... So you're going to oh, love no, this yeah, one. I've got an even better one. <laughs> okay, so the whole thing is, is that I need to do this without disturbing the children. Yes, bloody, bloody, bloody. With the nuns. So... Uh, and you know, when you're a young guy and your boss has told you what you've got to do, you, yeah. you're very careful. In those days, we had respect for, for, yes. for the chief. You know, he yeah. told you what to do and you did it properly. So, yes, okay. I haul a semi auto shotgun out, Oof. jack some shells into Jeez, it, like. right? And I'm now sneaking past the school building. <laughs> the right? shotgun. Because, yeah, but I'm trying to sneak to <laughs> the shotgun, right? Yeah, yeah. So, I've got it. Against my sata and I'm sneaking and the next thing a window pops open and Mother Superior pops out. Yes. Now what can I do? Yeah. Not so just be blunt. Yeah, yeah. And she looks at me, oh you here for the baboon, my boy. What you doing? Yes. yes. I'm here for the baboon. <laughs> she says, Oh, I see you're gonna dart it. And meanwhile I've got this whole handful <laughs> of shotgun <laughs> shell, the shotgun full of <laughs> twelve oh, gun shots. So I said, Yeah, oh, I said, Yeah, I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna dart it. But now <laughs> I'm starting to get a bit you know, now I can see already, oh, the boss is going to have people phoning and saying yes. they witnessed this bloody action. Anyway, I said, but they're very dangerous when they darted, right? Yeah. So just keep the kids inside and keep yeah. everyone inside. Yeah. Needless, I go and there's the poor old baboon sitting in the top of a pine tree oh. and he's watching me. I'm watching him. <laughs> we have a brief moment where we, our eyes cross and I shoot him stone dead. Drops okay. up the tree, boom, <laughs> on the ground. Okay. Now I've got to get the dead baboon down the alley. Right, past mother, all the classrooms, back to my vehicle that I'm not seeing. <laughs> I've got nothing to carry the baboon. I've got a shotgun and a dead baboon. <laughs> now, how do you get that back to the vehicle? So, mm -hmm. I thought about it. Okay, well, pick up the baboon nicely, like a baby. Mm -hmm. Picked up the oh, baboon right. nicely in my arms. Yes. Shotgun across here. Now I'm walking, and I can feel the sweat running down the back of my neck because I don't want to offend people and have them stay like the, the bath. I'm going to. <laughs> And I've got the stone dead baboon with his head lolling, and I can feel the blood oh. running down the inside of my shirt. Oh, weird. I kid you not, I get halfway, the window opens, and I look left and I look right, and there's just kids' faces stuck oh, against the window, all watching, and the mother <laughs> superior. And she says, Oh, you've darted him. I said, Yes, keep quiet, he's sleeping. You wake up, just keep quiet. And I. I promise you I was rigid as I can. I didn't even, I was absolutely rigid carrying that baboon oh, down the alley. And every window there were kids peering yeah. at me like this. this. And I could feel the blood running <laughs> down the front. Anyway, I got it to the vehicle and there was never anything said about oh, it. Obviously, oh, darted. And she did phone a couple of hours later. I said, No, he's come around. He's fine. He's gone again. It's all right. The Catholics can, you can handle a bit of blood. Okay, he has an even worse one. I get called three years ago. Sunday afternoon, Helen Vale. Yeah. Right? Okay. I'm telling you, we're talking gangster paradise now. Okay. There's a monkey yeah. trapped in a tree in a schoolyard. Let mm. me tell you, you have no idea. Drugs and alcohol really make them go wild. Okay. So these guys are tossing rocks at the monkey. But you've got people standing on one side of the tree, people standing on the other side of the Jeez, tree. Like and the rocks are going, bricks and yeah. rocks are going left oh, and right nice over the song. top, they're really hitting. And of course, when someone gets hit on that side, then they start throwing the rocks at the monkey, they start throwing <laughs> rocks at each other. <laughs> now, now imagine this, eh? you've got hundreds of drunk people, yeah. literally these thousands yeah. of people there. The whole There's area, a jaw happening. There. Everyone's there, <laughs> everyone in the whole of Helen Vale's there. <laughs> yes. The cops are there, the riot yeah. units there, the animal oh, anti cruelty no, leagues there, everybody's there, right? No word. And the monkey in the middle of this. And the monkey sitting in the top of the tree. Oh, there's no it. hope for catching him, etc., etc. Yeah, it's yeah. just a. there's only one way the monkey's got to go. But he needs to go so he doesn't get mauled and injured because they really do. Oh, if they see. get a hold of it, they maul them. Okay. Anyway, so the monkey's in the top of the tree. So I take my trusty silence point two to out. Yes. Against my yes. chest. Now I've got to go. And listen, the police actually have to clear the way because these they are going ballistic. Yeah. There's just no control on yeah, yeah. They're absolutely, they're almost uncon and the stones are flying and the bottles are flying and it's just going <laughs> wilder and wilder. Yeah. So I get my way through the crowd with the police is out. Now I get into the school grounds, virtually lock the gate, go in. Now when I start walking, I just hear this chanting behind me, sniper, sniper, sniper. sniper. So the whole lot are just <laughs> chanting, sniper, sniper. So now I get into the school grounds. Yeah, yeah. They must know, hey, 
this is not something I get paid for. This is I've got to do a favour. Yes. And the cruelty <laughs> league said this animal's going to be badly injured. You need to do what's oh, got to be done here. Okay. Get inside. So the kind lady from Animal Anti Cruelty League comes to us. You know, Arnold, these kids see so much violence. Yeah. Can we not? I said, listen, the monkey's sitting on top of the tree. There's yeah. nothing I can do. Yeah, yeah. You know, the monkey's not going to come any lower. He's going to stay right up high there. I've got to take him up from the top of the tree. Yeah, yeah. Anyway. Now it's getting even wild and there's a hum and everything. Yeah. She says, listen, can you not do it in a way that they can see nothing? I said, no, it's impossible. I mean, it's an open school field, one tree, yeah. 5,000 people around, the, <laughs> banging against the thing, throwing rocks and bottles. What can I do? Yeah, yeah. So I take a nice rest on the side of the building. And beautiful shot, headshot, the monkey drops out the tree. Yeah. Hits the ground. But as it, hits, as it starts falling, you just hear this crowd chanting. Skid on that's a cop bar, skid on that's a cop. The whole lot of them are chanting. These little children are all chanting it. Obviously, the way they brought up in the game. It was frightening. It was a frightening indictment on the area and the people. And you have to have sympathy in that kind of environment. I mean, how did those children get brought up? And that's what they're all saying. You know, forget the children are not used to violence. Yeah, the whole lot was singing and chanting that one. You know, and 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 uh, and there there we go back to all the, um, the the church people and the Catholics and the whatever the nuns and my mother and and um, what is her name uh, the, the the nun that was uh, doing work in that area as well. <laughs> you know, back to the people that were trying try and stop the poverty, try and stop the thing, and that's when you have to step back and and try and look at the big picture. You know, yeah. I mean, I yeah. I go into yeah. those areas quite often for wildlife issues and that, and yeah. it is. Yeah, you've got to have, safety. listen, I'll tell you one thing, you've got to have real yeah. balls to go into those areas. Balls. I mean, I've often had to go and rescue owls and stuff, and you just yeah. feel the hair in the back of your neck yeah. rise, because you can see them everywhere waiting. Yeah, and yeah. the unfortunate thing is there are so many good people that are trapped yeah. in amongst in the gangsters. Of course, yes. And you get to see it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Your proudest moment, final question. Proudest thing, perhaps, I mean... Uh, you, you, you're, uh, we always, everybody says they're children, but you haven't got children, so you don't have to worry about that one. So now, that's, uh, the proudest moment, probably, maybe, uh, you know, I'm not even going to guide you, but you must tell mm. me. My well, proudest moment. Yeah, yeah. You know, I put a lot of effort into my dogs. I love my dogs very much, yeah. my German short ears. I spend a lot okay. of time training and working with them. German short ears. So, <laughs> when, uh, you know, I've really great moments, and the, there's... Just when the dogs do exceptionally well, that oh. I really love. Do they I do really like love. competitions I great stuff, pro- right? Yeah, with competition. Competitions, I really love. So field what do they do? They? Working they're, gun dog trials. Okay, so, so, so they actually work as gun dogs. So it's almost like hunting dogs, I yeah, suppose. Yeah, they're so gun dogs. Do you, you whistle see, for them? Or do they no, them, or yeah. Do they? No, the whole thing of training those dogs is really? more complicated. So what initially happened is my passion for birds of prey started not only from my conservation days, because as a young conservationist, I was taken by... An old guy called William Hussain, who's now dead, yeah. and he used to take me around. He used to take me to all the crowned eagle nest sites. So I had a wonderful background in going to crowned eagle nest sites and martial eagle nest sites yeah. and because I was the youngster. I'd climb and collect okay, yeah. prey remains and do all go the crappy stuff. Go. Yeah, you go on, on all up, the, up the yellowwood tree. Yeah. Don't worry about that crowned eagle going to kill you, but just get that prey remain. Let's see what that is. Oh, yeah. throw that goat skull away. We don't need farmers yeah. know that you goats. You know, that kind of stuff. So Jeez, anyway, so I had this thing. So. My big thing always was falconry. Okay. Right. So that is a big passion of mine. I love so training falcons and wow. particularly peregrine falcons. Okay. And the dogs and training falcons are one. Mm-hmm. They're, part, they're part of a tradition that is over a thousand years old. Okay. In fact, okay. falconry is well over a thousand years old. Sure. So, you know, that is the thing that actually got me into gun dogs. Yeah. And it's actually something that actually got me to realize how intelligent dogs actually are. Yeah. So as technology is advanced, and I kind of, I hate technology, but also love it. Yeah. So now we work dogs with GPS collars on. So we can yeah. tell yeah. a lot of things about dogs that we didn't know, working dogs. Mm. We can tell that dogs will recognize an area and go to a particular spot every time. Jeez. And you can bring it back a year yeah. later and put that dog down. Yeah. And you can watch in your GPS and you can compare the pattern from a year. And we'll go straight to that wow. spot, to that spot where it found something. Yeah. You know, so those are the kind of things that make me tick. So in my yeah. spare time... Peregrine falcon, dogs. So that's your, real, that's your real passion there. Yeah. Going on. I, 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 so I, like I, I mean, there is nothing in this world that competes to yeah. a set of pointers and point and a covey of partridge and a peregrine falcon yeah. up 
Yep, Birmingham Falcons, six, yeah. seven hundred foot above you, waiting for the flush of a partridge. Do they watch that bird as well? Well, you know, it's quite interesting with the Falcons. They love the dogs. So yeah, once, okay. and they develop a very strong, and it's it's something that's come through a long time. So yeah. all of your working gun dogs, your bird dogs, and that have a very yeah. close affinity with falcons and okay. falconry. Yeah. So the falcons bond to a certain dog. Yeah. And I had an old bitch called Storm, but she was the most brilliant bird finder of the lot. Old yeah. German short hair bitch, and I loved her to death. She probably... You know, it's a dog that I still get a tear in my eye when I think of old storm. But so one of my favorite, and I give my birds all the same name, Hawk. I just call them Hawk. Hawk. It's just simpler. <laughs> Let's go Hawk. So she knew that wherever storm was on point, there'd always be birds. And yeah. she'd get success with the storm. Yeah. So she'd mount up. And the first thing, when you take the hood off and you unleash her, now no, she's going to mount. Okay. The first thing she'd do is she'd actually look for storm. Oh, really? And then as soon as she saw where Storm was on point, then she'd go and she'd sure. up, okay. up, 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 and then she'd wait over Storm. Oh, and really? my command for my dogs is good dogs, and the dogs go in and they flash, the partridge erupt, okay, yeah. and the hawk has its chance. And, and quite often they miss, they don't catch every single time. <laughs> and we go home and we laugh because the partridge was too clever and the old wily partridge get away, and sometimes they have great success.